Добрый день всем. Здравствуйте. Good afternoon, everyone. Сейчас мы начнем буквально через две минуты подведение итогов года с президентом Владимиром Путиным. Вы знаете, что это смешанный формат. Я хочу еще раз это напомнить. Это совмещение прямая линия и пресс-конференция. Ту часть, которая касается общения президента с вами, с представителями СМИ, будет модерировать ваш покорный слуга или сам президент, как он это любит делать. А та часть, которая касается общения президента с гражданами, ответа на вопросы граждан, на обращение граждан, будут модерировать мои коллеги, мои друзья. Это Екатерина Березовская и Павел Зарубин. Я попрошу вас, когда когда вы здесь задаете свой вопрос, пожалуйста, вставайте, вам дадут микрофон, назовите себя, назовите свое СМИ и говорите. Микрофон будут держать мои коллеги, которые вам помогают. Буду признателен вам, если вы приведете свои все телефоны в беззвучное состояние. Заранее спасибо. Пожалуйста. Спасибо, Дмитрий Сергеевич. Ровно две you, недели мы принимали вопросы We've со всей страны. Число обращений действительно колоссальное. Uh, говорит и показывает без преувеличения вся Россия. Прямо, честно и откровенно. И в это колоссальное число обращений мы с Екатериной тоже вникли максимально детально. Просмотрели тысячи вопросов. Indeed, the past two weeks seem to be the, the largest um, poll all over Russia. We felt not only as journalists together with Pavel, but also as sociologists. It is natural that it's impossible to answer the, these millions of questions, all of them. But there are common topics. What is the main topic? The main one is special military operation. The, our military servicemen are writing to us, all things considered, you know, benefits, payments, and so on, and we'll talk about that in detail, naturally. Also, traditional, uh, popular questions such as uh, utilities, uh, sports, and many others. So we're prepared to kick off. Well, this year, right at the very stage of gathering all the questions, we engage the National People's Front, so there is no doubt that all of the calls and appeals will be processed and will not remain unanswered. The activists of uh, NPF are prepared to do that. However, the most relevant and uh, interesting questions will be voiced today. Yesterday, a question uh, came in about the salary not being paid and um, salary was paid actually that very day in the evening. There are plenty of questions that are yet unsolved and the thing is that we're living in a world that's completely different and people are worried not only about social matters. It is now before the new year. It's time to take stock of the year. December is traditionally filled with many events. Last week, uh, Mr. President, you've announced your decision to run for president in this um, against this background what kind of attacks do you have um, abroad and domestically what are the main questions for you well I spoke about that many times but it bears repeating now for such country as Russia the very existence of our country without sovereignty is impossible it will simply not exist, at least in the in the state that it, it exists now and uh, existed for thousands of years. So the main thing is to st 
strengthen the sovereignty. However, it's a very broad term. Um, external sovereignty, that means strengthening our military power and security and safety on our borders, strengthening our social sovereignty, public sovereignty. That means absolute observation um, of the rights and freedoms of our citizens, of strengthening our political system, parliamentarism, and finally, that is providing security and sovereignty in economic and technological sphere. Well, I don't think that uh, in responding to this question, I don't need to cover all of these matters, but I'm quite positive that the audience that we have here and the rest of the country is fully aware that Russia cannot exist without it financial, economic, and technological sovereignty is the future of any country, including Russia. So if we talk in concepts, these are the main dimensions. Let's turn to economy. Many in the world have been surprised that the Russian economy did not collapse under the burden of the so-called you know, pressure sanctions, you know, pressure from our former so-called partners. But it's apparent that they have the goal to push Russia to the limit and to make it buckle. So what kind of resilience does the Russian economy have? It's resilient enough not to only feel quite confident, but to move forward. And this resilience, well, we've discussed it many times as well, but I'll repeat myself. That is ensured by several components. The first one, and the most important one, is the tremendous consolidation of the Russian society. The second thing is sustainability of financial and economic system of the country. It came as a surprise to our so-called partners, and honestly to many of us as well, that over the past decades, Russia has gained this resilience and sustainability in finance and economy. And the third component, naturally, is greater capacity of our forces, I mean security forces and the army. And if we talk about the economic indicators, specific indicators, what can we be proud of? Well, as per usual, I brought a table over. There is nothing um, special that we don't know, but I think that Yesterday, finance minister voiced several indicators yesterday. The main indicator is growth of GDP of our economy at the end of the year is expected at 3.5 percent. That is a good indicator. That means that we bounced back from the dip um, last year. I think we stood at it at 2.1 percent. If this year we gain 3.5 percent, that means we bounced back and made a, quite a significant step forward. Unfortunately, we have uh, inflation growth. That is so, and we expect 7.5 percent at the end of the year, maybe even higher, um, reaching almost 8 percent. The central bank and the government have taken all the necessary measures, and we can discuss that later. We can talk about the increase in interest rates and so on, other measures that the central bank and the government have um, undertaken, and we hope that we can go back to the targeted level of inflation. Industrial production is growing confidently, 3.6 percent. But what's especially um, makes us happy, manufacturing 7.5 percent, that is um, year-on-year -year growth. This is a, an unexpected, unexpectedly high rate. And what makes us especially positive is 10 percent growth investment into main capital, fixed capital. That means that today we have uh, apparent growth in GDP and industry, plus 10 percent and in fixed capital investments. That means that midterm we have ensured our sustainable growth. There will be new jobs created, expansion of industry, and so on. As for unemployment, I'll speak about it later. The profit uh, stands at 24 percent of the industry, let alone banks. They are going to earn almost three trillion rubles, even more. Of course, I know that in this audience and from around the country that, yes, the banks are doing fine. They're going through fat years. But those people who are storing their money in Russian banks, that's, a, that's good news for them. 
the sustainability of the Russian banking and financial system. Now on to um, real wages. It's going to increase by about 8% year on year with the, uh, without inflation. Well, this will not be a universal picture across the country, <clears throat> but uh, more or less these are specific, precise statistics. And the real disposable incomes of our people will also be growing. There are more components are therein, but it's going to be about 5% growth, the unemployment rates. Recently, we were proud of record low levels of 3% of unemployment, and yesterday, while getting ready for today's talk. We saw that it, it stood at 2.9 percent. We've never seen that low unemployment before. This is a very good integrated or aggregate parameter of the overall economic performance. When I spoke about the real disposable incomes rise, I must mention that starting from the 1st of January, we will increase the minimal wage by 18 percent, which is not something that we do frequently. The, the public debt has been shrinking, which also testifies to the macroeconomic and financial stability. The public debt slumped from 46 to 32 billion USD, and the private external debt also has dwindled. All our companies have been repaying on schedule. It, it went down from $337 billion to 297. So the repayment is on time, sometimes even before, ahead of schedule. Well, the aggregate social parameters. Also, we'll talk a lot about social and welfare matters today, but th there is a comprehensive uh, parameter of the life expectancy growth. In the 2021, the life expectancy in this country was 70.06. In 2022, 72.73. And, and in 2023, we expect the life expectancy at 74 years, so which is an, is an indicator showing that we are doing fine in terms of our welfare and social policies and economic policies. The other day, you uh, awarded some of the heroes of Russia, and you said that the guys should be spared, but we should uh, continue pressing for two years. We have been living in amidst the special military operation, so we receive a spate of questions from uh, everybody on that. How, what is your take on, on these two years? What is the current pace? What goals uh, may be? Are they the same or have they changed? And when we will arrive at peace. The peace will come when we reach our goals that you have mentioned. And coming back to the goals, they remain unchanged. I, I will remind you, it, it means denazification, demilitarization of Ukraine and its neutral status. Let's have a look from the perspe perspective of denazification during the uh, negotiations that followed after the preparation of a draft of possible agreement back then. That was mentioned by the Kiev authorities the other day. Well, they, on the whole, they did not agree they needed some denazification, saying that there was no Nazism uh, growth in, in that country. Well, how come? Their national hero is a well-known Nazi figure, Bandera, who has been proclaimed a national hero. How come that? Yes, they do have it. And when today's head of presidential office in Kiev, before the whole world gives a round of applause to a former SS soldier that participated in the Holocaust, which was the extermination of 1.5 million of Jews, Poles, and Russians, and it gave him a standing ovation. Is it not a manifestation of Nazism? So denazification is a relevant thing. During the, those talks, 
we were told that, well, actually they did not, would not rule out enacting some legal acts. That was during that series of talks in Istanbul. Now, with respect to demilitarizing Ukraine, unless they want to come to terms peacefully, we have to take some action, including military action. But today, Ukraine virtually produces or manufactures nothing. They have been trying to maintain their manufacturing capability, but you know, actually, they have been uh, importing things for free. Uh, Freeloading, but you know it will come to an end sooner or later. Well, they they will keep receiving some aid, but you know the exterminate the, the annihilation continues with respect to uh, aircraft and air defense systems. They received like 420 or 30 tanks, as had been promised. Everything had been delivered. I mean, all the things that the Westerners had promised were supplied, but all of that was annihilated. 747 tanks were destroyed as of last night since the start of the counteroffensive. Around 2,300 armored personnel vehicles of different types. So this is demilitarizing. Either we come to terms on the specific military parameters, and we did. Uh, agree upon these parameters that were put into the litter bin later. And so we have other 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 opportunities either to come to terms or to to have our way compellingly. Well a short question, a brief question, where there will be a second wave of mobilization. I know it is a sensitive matter. So look we had some partial mobilization. We recruited three hundred thousand people. And at the outset, there uh, has been a great deal of there was a great deal of irony and and derision. They were called recruits, recruits, but they have been doing an excellent job. Now we have 14 heroes of Russia out of those people recruited back then, and a lot of other decorations also were awarded to them. So now around 244,000 people, servicemen are in the operation area. Regiments have been formed to service the military equipment because there, there are a lot of very good uh, professionals. Around 41,000 people have been dismissed because of we reached the, the 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 age limit or have some health problems and after that we started a broad campaign to attract volunteers to sign contracts with the armed forces and uh, we planned to recruit 400 and uh, or 400 something thousand people as of last night I was reported, I was informed that 406,000 people have been recruited and the inflow of men that are ready to defend their motherland with arms is not dwindling. 1.5 thousand every day up and down the country. So together with the volunteers. Well, the, a contract is signed for two or three years term uh, by the so-called volunteers, although all these are the warriors of their fatherland. Well, there, there are yearly terms, but it's going to be around half a million of people till the end of the year. Why do we need another wave of mobilization? No need at, about uh, of that currently. Uh, if you allow me, if you allow me, I re I remind you that we have a blended format of a hotline and uh, a press conference. So probably, if I may, oh, just a second. I apologize. Well, actually, we have a democracy here. Now, just uh, Mr. Peskov. 
please proceed. Uh, yeah, we'll give her a mic. Uh, the mass media are hectic people. My name is Ludmila Kuliva. I represent North Ossetia, uh, Republic, region number 15. Mr. President, uh, North Ossetia has always stood guard of the interests of our country. Ipsatle, Khajurat Mansurov are the warlords and the heroes of the Soviet Union that obtained glory during the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War now. Many residents of uh, North and South Ossetia and all the uh, North Caucasus uphold the interests of our motherland. We have a lot of volunteers. We have two volunteer squads, Storm Ossetia and Alania. And today, the contracted servicemen receive a lot of benefits and support measures. Whether the volunteers can also expect to receive those allowances. You know, I have looked through the questions. Well, definitely there is a, a huge spate of them. It is impossible. 2.1 million, 2.1 million of questions. Well, Mr. Peskov brought in a pile, a huge pile, a thick pile of questions, and I looked them through. I reiterate my position. Well, we may have more questions of that kind. All the volunteers, all those bearing arms and defending the interests of this country, risking their lives and their, their health, will enjoy the level playing field, the equitable conditions. There are some, some flaws, we know about them, and yesterday I analyzed the letters and I spoke to the defense minister and head of the general staff and Madam Golikova, the deputy prime minister in charge of the warfare. So on some of the matters, we'll have to amend the legislation. Probably we'll come back to that during the press conference. I'm sure that the members of parliament will definitely support, certainly support that. And uh, we need to put it in proper language. And uh, everybody should receive equitable support equal support from uh, the state. I know Storm Alania, uh, Storm City and Alania are brilliant warriors, and the head of that, uh, that region told me about that. And this is the pile I have selected. Well, the, the certificates of war veterans issues, and let's uh, receive a video question. Sergei Sobolev from Novosibirsk phoning in the city of Askitin. Mr. President, good afternoon. It's a huge privilege and an honor to speak to you from Donbass. We are very far from the front line, and you can hear the warfare well enough. The Storm Brigade of Defense Ministry is behind me. They're veterans. This is a brigade that bears your name. These have been around here for two years near Donetsk, and they are quite firm, and uh, the chance of the enemy is about to break down. It's, it's, it's all in cracks, and each day brings good results. Our victory is, is close, and even the enemy knows that. But when the war is over, one has to care for all these people that participated in the war. The veterans have huge combat experience. They are a model of real patriots, and they could also educate the uh, youths and prepare and train people to be the succession pool for the army. Probably there is a point in establishing a patriotic structure, a body. Well, thank. first of all, I'd like to thank you for all that you have been doing. This may be a customary phrase, but actually, I, speak, I tell that with all my heart, and, you know, very many commanders have, have told me that, you know, we have veterans at a certain area of the front, and for sure, that will guarantee full control of the situation. This is the uh, a proper assessment of what you can achieve at battlefield with respect to the relevance of uh, such people as you 
to bring up and educate youths, our school children and youngsters in general. It is very, very relevant to the utmost degree. And this is absolutely obvious, especially during the turning points in history like we're experiencing these days. Uh, it would be quite misplaced to remember the words of Bismarck, but still, he used to serve and live in Russia even though he became a prominent German figure. He said that wars are not won by generals, they are won by school teachers and priests. And he was right. This is a very precise statement. The upbringing of young people in the spirit of patriotism, in the good sense of the word, is most important. And we're already beginning to do that. Over a thousand of your colleagues, your brothers in arms, who have served and come back to peaceful life, over a thousand of them are working in schools, working with children and teenagers. And we will keep doing that. We will keep expanding these activities. It is one thing to read about something in a textbook or watch a movie. And it's absolutely different to meet someone in person, to show an example. The best education is a personal example that you show. And who could do a better job than you? We are alive. We we can see the people, the reactions. Please, Dmitry Sergeyevich, over to you. Uh, I am sorry, Dmitry. Uh, I see the poster saying Volga is dying. What is it about? Let's take this question. Hello, Mr. Putin. My name is Ilan Usmanova, the business newspaper of Tatarstan Business Online. This year, the people of the Volga region have experienced the catastrophic lowering of the level of the Kuybyshev water reserve. Throughout the summer, the water has been flowing down the Volga from our water reserve. They were saying that they were trying to save the fisheries of Astrakhan. Do you think there is a solution for the Volga water level problem? And don't you think that we may lose this river due to shallowing? I hope this doesn't happen. There is a conflict of interest between the energy industry and other water users downstream the Volga. The energy producers want to keep the levels high to make sure that the volume of electricity production from the Volga cascade and the dams is sufficient to ensure the energy supply for the industry and the economy and the users. However, the eels using the water downstream, like the fisheries and the shipping industry, want to ensure their transportation lane and want the river to be deeper. We're aware of all these issues related to Volga. The government is working on that, and we will not let it flow idle. Sure, I know there is a problem. We will continue. Yes, our colleague is quite active. Let's keep the parity. We may come back over to Mr. Peskov. Thank you. I see a journalist from Itertas in the middle sector, the first row. Please, over to you. The Kremlin pool. Mr. Putin, good afternoon. Ekaterina Krastovtseva, TAS agency. We have a question on the international agenda. The question is threefold. First, do you see any prospects in normalizing relations with the European Union? Recently, it's been becoming apparent that the West is growing tired of supporting Ukraine. What do you think about that? Another question. The right politicians are getting stronger on the European political scene. How could you comment on that? Are you concerned about that? Thank you. Speaking of normalizing the relations, it's not only up to us. We did not ruin the relations. They did that. They've always been trying to push us back to the backstage and the background, disregarding our interests. The conflict that took place in Ukraine, how did it begin? Let us remember. Let us take three or four minutes. 
It all began with a coup d'etat in Ukraine in 2014. Before that, we've been trying our best for decades. We've been trying to build normal relations with Ukraine, even following essentially a coup d'etat when Viktor Yanukovych wasn't allowed to come to power when he won the elections. They declared a third tour of the elections, the third round, even though this went against the Constitution. This was something like a creeping coup d'etat, but we accepted that. So what happened next? He won the elections. Next one. So what did our so-called opponents do? They committed a coup d'etat. You see, here is the problem. Despite the tragedy of these events, we've always been saying that the Russians and the Ukrainians are one people, essentially, and what we're witnessing now is a great tragedy resembling a civil war between the brothers, when brothers are on opposing sides. And it's not even their fault. The entire southeast of Ukraine has always been pro-Russian. Historically, these were Russian territories. My colleague is raising the poster saying Turkey. He knows that the entire Turkish and the Black Sea region knows that the entire Black Sea shore went to Russia following the Russian-Turkish wars. This has nothing to do with Ukraine. Odessa is a Russian city. Crimea is Russian. Everyone knows that perfectly well. But they started making up historical nonsense, saying that back in the day Vladimir Lenin gave those territories to Ukraine when the Soviet Union was established. We accepted that even after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We accepted that and we were ready to live with that. But the Southeast, the pro-Russian part, was always important to us during the elections. They've always been voting for those who promoted the pro-Russian policies both inside and outside of Ukraine. And uh, this was perfectly fine for Russia. But following the coup d'etat in 2014, it was perfectly clear that they wouldn't allow us to build normal relations with Ukraine. The coup d'etat that the Americans spent $5 billion on, they stated this openly. In 2014, three foreign ministers came from Europe the Polish minister, the German, and the French. And so they signed up as guarantors of the agreements between the authorities, President Yanukovych, and the opposition. They said that everything would be resolved peacefully. But two days later, they committed a coup d'etat. Why? They could have gone to the elections. But no, they had to create a conflict. Who did that? It was our American so-called friends. The Europeans, who had signed up as guarantors of the agreements between the authorities and the opposition, pretended to know nothing. Now, ask anyone in Europe, can anyone remember that? Of course they don't, but we do, and we will not forget it. In their aspiration to creep up to our borders and take Ukraine into NATO, they have led us into a tragedy. Remember the violent events in Donbass throughout eight years. All of this resulted in the current tragedy. They forced our hand. And so, when I talk about the United States, they organized that, and Europe is only playing into their hands. How can we build a relation with them? We are ready for that, but the Europeans pretend to know and remember nothing. They made only two or three references to the Minsk agreements they had signed, although they had no intention of complying with them. That was a pretend signature. The guarantees between the authorities and the opposition in Ukraine in 2014 were supposedly signed by them too, and immediately disregarded. Here is what I'm talking about. They have mostly lost their sovereignty. Many of their decisions are harming themselves, but still they do that. Many European public figures on the surface are acting like General de Gaulle, who was fighting for the interests of France 
with weapons. He assembled all the French people to show resistance to the occupying forces. However, in practice, they're acting like Marshal Pétain. Even though he was a hero of World War I, in World War II, he was a Nazi collaborationist. He accepted the will of the occupying forces. Almost everyone's acting like that. A few people can be an exception. For example, we see some examples like Viktor Orban in Hungary and some other people. They are not pro-Russian politicians. They are pro-national politicians protecting their own national interests. There are no people like that anymore. I am not sure about the explanation. They are too reliant on their big brother, the United States. Still, we're ready to build relations with them. Speaking of the United States, we're ready to talk to them too. We believe that the United States is an important and necessary country for the world. However, their absolutely imperial policy is hurting themselves. It's not even hurting us, it's hurting them first and foremost because in the public eye they have to act as an empire. And when they're trying to compromise on something, their voters see this as a failure. That's why the elites are forced to act in this way. As soon as something changes domestically, this would establish the fundamental conditions that would allow them to respect others, to respect other countries, to seek compromise rather than use the force and sanctions. Only then will we see the fundamental conditions to establish full-fledged relations with them. So far, we see none, but we are ready. Uh, let me talk a bit more. Not all the military journalists are on front line. I see someone in that sector over there, Mr. Nikolai Dolgachev. Over to you, sir. Mr. Putin, good afternoon. Nikolai Dolgachev, Vesti, the office in Lugansk. The Lugansk Republic has almost been liberated, but still we're concerned and we know that the fighting is active in the south and along the Dnipro River. And for some time, we've been, they've been talking about the enemy front line on the left bank of the Dnipro and in the Krinky locality. What is that concentration of Ukrainian forces and how can you comment on that? And let me remind you that in the liberated territories, further away from the front line, we see active work to restore those territories, to restore the infrastructure and the social sites. We see that life is changing, but still there are questions and concerns. So let me ask you, what is the future of the new regions of our country? What is the end goal? What will happen in a few years? What will these regions look like as part of Russia? We know that your world is in order, so please tell us what will happen. I wish it could work like that. Unfortunately, we see something different in the world practice. I believe that everyone present here in this audience and every listener and viewer knows that we speak about something and then something works, something doesn't, and that's okay. Still, we should aspire to reach our goals. Now speaking about these regions specifically, And speaking about the enemy forces, they have declared their major counteroffensive, but they have failed everywhere. The recent attempt was made, at least as of today, it looked like the last attempt, if in fact. They were trying to break through in the left bank of Dnipro River and uh, move towards Crimea. Everyone was talking about that. Everyone knew that. This is no use see what happened in that part of the front line. The Ukrainian armed forces have concentrated their artillery strikes in a very narrow part of the left bank to make sure we can save our guys and not to endanger them, not to take too much losses. We decided, the military command decided to withdraw a few meters. You're a military journalist, you know what I'm talking about withdrew into the forest to save the people, to save them from the unnecessary losses. Uh, 
Then the Ukrainian forces entered this territory around uh, 1,200 uh, long. And I don't know why they're doing this. They are pushing their people, uh, um, and these people are going to be killed. And Ukrainian military say that uh, this is the road, uh, one-way road. They're sending their military. Like there was around, there were around 80 people at the time. Now there are fewer people. They use only boats, but they are, um, are affected by artillery, drones, and other arms. Our military have uh, sanitary losses: two, three, six uh, wounded people. And uh, the enemy losses tens of uh, people. So they are now staying in this area only because of the political uh, causes. And they are sending the military there only because of the political reasons. So we can only imagine why is this happening. We can only um, imagine that this is related to the visits uh, to the to foreign countries to um, get financing uh, for the country, for the military, for the equipment. Uh, this is their approach. They are going to other countries uh, asking for money. And now they have to show that the Ukrainian army has some chances to reach at least something um, without uh, thinking about any losses uh, in the context of the so-called counteroffensive. And people are get um, and the military is getting pushed out of there. They could uh, uh, they could do something, but they understand that they will be destroyed. That is what is happening, and I would like to point out. These are not just um, the military of the Ukrainian armed forces. Forces. This is elite. These are uh, storm troops. Storm troops. There are not many of them. Let's take like uh, one month and a half. We and we see the losses that of the Ukrainian armed forces, and we understand that this is very uh, sensitive for them. I think that this is foolish and irresponsible uh, for the political leadership of the country. But their it's their decision. It was said. Just try not to push them too early from there. It's uh, very useful for us to uh, send uh, people there. It's very useful for us. This is the logic of uh, the armed fight. And they're continuing to do that. This is a tragedy for them, I think. But, uh, well, the minister said that uh, this the territory will be narrowed, and this is uh, happening. And I think that uh, this situation will end. Well, if we're speaking about the situation in the front, you all know it very well. You are experts. And sometimes I look at you and uh, i uh, really afraid and I see girls on the front line uh, running over there. Well, I should uh, ask to keep women out of it because uh, I'm really afraid to look at that. But what can I say about the situation? Along the line, the front line, our armed forces are improving their situation. They are working actively. I'm speaking about uh, all the front line and uh, the situation is improving. As for the future of the regions, there are many issues. Uh, there are many questions about this from the new regions and from other parts of the Russian Federation, what will happen, how will they develop. Every year, the federal budget has more than one trillion rubles for that. For the development of uh, these regions, 
to introduce them progressively into the social and economic life of the Russian Federation. In other regions, the situation is much better. For instance, like in Crimea, um, Kiev authorities were not paying a lot of attention to them. But every year we provided one trillion rubles, and uh, this is what we'll go into invest uh, in the future. We also have uh, fraternal relations between these regions and other regions of the Russian Federation. Around 150 billion rubles were provided by the regions. Other regions will also provide around one. 100 billion rubles. But what I would like to say is this year these new regions paid to the federal budget 170 billion rubles. What does it say? It means that the economy of these regions is a restoring and now it is a normal, in normal state. Yes, a lot has to be done, and we will do it. We are working live, uh, and there are some technical issues. Uh, earlier, we saw a video question from Sergei Zenin. Well, uh, I would like to speak to a colleague from Turkey. Let's listen to the question. And then we'll turn to uh, the military correspondent. Uh, and there are also girls around the military correspondent. Nadulo Agency. Mr. President, the results of the attacks of the Israel in the Gaza Strip. Every six, seven minutes, one child is dying. 8,000 Palestinian children have died and 6,000 women. Unfortunately, the UN and uh, the biggest uh, countries of the world cannot stop these attacks. What do you think? Has the UN lost its function? And because of this situation, uh, is still uh, uh, Palestine is it is is Palestine still existing? And uh, is Turkey and Russia doing anything to preserve the peace, to establish the peace in the region? And what Moscow and Ankara? Uh, are planning in the sphere of regional uh, questions. Uh, are you planning to visit Turkey in the nearest future? Thank you. Well, first of all, I see what is happening in the Gaza Strip. That is uh, just uh, my evaluations. Uh, I agree with what is, has been said. I would like to uh, say that uh, President Erdogan plays a leading role in this, in uh, restoring the situation in Gaza Strip. He is one of the leaders of the international community who uh, pay attention to this tragedy and do everything to change the situation for the better, to create conditions for long-term peace. And this is obvious. And he's very active on this track. And I wish him uh, all the best. Everything that is happening is a, a catastrophe. There is also a situation related to the Ukrainian crisis. But uh, you and everyone here, everyone in the world, see. Let's see, see what is happening in the special military operation and in Gaza Strip. Everyone can see the difference. Nothing like that is happening in Ukraine if we compare it to Gaza Strip. There are thousands of women and children. The Secretary General of the UN said that today Gaza Strip is uh, the biggest cemetery of children in the world. And uh, this evaluation means a lot. This is an objective evaluation. As for the role of the UN, there is nothing unusual in this. I have uh, been speaking about this during Cold War Different uh, states uh, were blocking some decisions uh, that were promoted by other states. But initially, the UN was created to find consensus. 
if it is not found, then the decisions cannot be made. Nothing unusual is happening in the life of the UN. It was always like that, especially for taking a Cold War. The uh, Mr. Gromyka, foreign minister, uh, he, he was called Mr. No because uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Union was always v uh, using his veto right. Well, if uh, something, uh, if a country thinks that something, some actions are hostile, and uh, then they will not be taken, and this is important to have such mechanisms because then the UN will only be used as a platform to talk. After the First World War, for instance, that what this happened. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, try to find consensus. Like Turkey, we think that. We should implement uh, the UN decisions about the creation of the Palestine state or with the capital in the eastern Jerusalem. We need to create fundamental basis for the Israeli-Palestine settlement. As for the plans, we stay in constant contact with the President Erdogan, and we have very similar positions. I think that we'll meet with him. I plan to do that. I was planning to do that. There is, it's not a secret. Uh, uh, President Erdogan didn't have time because of his schedule. Well, I'm ready to go to Turkey, and I informed him about that. Uh, but, well, he couldn't do this because of his schedule. It was not my fault. Maybe uh, in the beginning of the next year, we'll have a visit. As for our efforts, you know that in two Arab countries uh, we have consultations in Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. First of all, we need to preserve people, we need to protect people in Gaza Strip. We are always in, on, in contact on that. We need to provide massive humanitarian support to people. When we were in the United Arab Emirates, I was there. We knew that uh, Emirates created in Gaza Strip, not in Gaza Strip, but near it, near the uh, border, they created a hospital there, a field hospital. So um, maybe it's that Russia could open its own field hospital there uh, at the stadium. For that, uh, we need uh, the permission of uh, the Egypt and Israel. I have spoken to President of Egypt. Uh, he's in favor of that, supports this idea. I have spoken to the Prime Minister Netanyahu. We had consultations on that uh, uh, with um, special forces, and uh, Israel thinks uh, that uh, uh, Russian hospital uh, will not will be in danger in Gaza Strip, but it doesn't mean that we will stop these efforts. Maybe today it's dangerous and Israel will not support it. However, we have some agreements with Israel, and they asked us about that. They asked us to uh, provide more medical equipment and uh, medicine. We will do that without any doubt. With all the countries, uh, we stay in contact and we will continue to work actively with them. Let's speak about uh, girls, uh, women that will work uh, on the front line. Now we'll speak to Valentina Solovyova. Uh, she's now working in uh, the region of Zaporizhia. Hello. Right now we're at Melitopol um, Cancer Ward. This is the regional war. You can see how many people are stationed in each room, three and six beds placed here. The, the head doctor, Konstantin Lakunin, Dr. Lakunin, we see that you have a lot of patients. So what's the situation with doctors? We have a lot of patients, and naturally, um, just like in the rest of Russia, we don't have enough docu doctors, but maybe we have a more dramatic situation. We need um, oncologists hematologists, peds, oncologists, well, there's simply not 
not present here. So we have um, we have as a cancer ward to take over the functions thanks to federal research centers that are helping us with clinical and methodological support. They're taking our patients for treatment. How many patients per doctor as of now? As an uh, outpatient care, 50 or 60 people per day and 30 um, as supposed to be as a standard. So um, the burden of the, pa the patient burden is um, at double. The same applies for inpatient care, 20 people per doctor. That is also twice as high as a standard. Still, you're um, developing, you have some medicines in common. Yes, uh, we're renovating, a large, we're doing a large-scale renovation for surgical ward, and we're doing everything according to federal program standards. This is a surgical table for new um, surgical rooms. So we believe that we'll start working with great success, with new success. So. Um, the patient, uh, the, the matter of staffing is very important, is, is very acute. You wanted to ask it? Yes, it's, it's a question and also a proposal. Maybe we could create a special federal program to bring in staff to new regions into um, healthcare and social sphere of the new regions. Possibly this could be um, residential construction as well as uh, land plans, possibly um, mortgages with certain benefits and concessions, but we need to um, attract people here. Is the salary competitive? Yes, it's it's very competitive, and I think people are coming over for that salary. I cannot say that people are not traveling here, but it seems that these measures are not enough. So that is our question. Thank you. It's very understandable. You know, I was happy to, to hear uh, the fact that we don't have enough specialists and doctors, just like uh, in the rest of Russia. And that's a quote. So there is a, a feeling that their region, uh, the region of Zaporozhye, is, is part of Russia. I wanted to reference that and to highlight that question. This issue is very understandable. The idea to create a special federal program that would help by apartments and flats um, at the federal level. I don't know whether it's necessary, but we do need to pay attention to that. We have a special mortgage program for that region at 2%. And it's way more than a, a concession, even better than for um, families with children. But as I understand the issue is that these benefits can be applied only to um, newly erected buildings, and it seems there are not quite a lot of those new buildings. So just like in the Far East, I think we need to expand it to secondary housing, and we need to work really fast and to start doing that work right away. That's number one. Number two, as for creating additional encouragement, well, if if the doctor has said that the salary is competitive, then what else is needed? Shubrat, uh, is, that means hello in Mordovin. Yes, I'll respond to your question. So when, what needs to be done? Possibly, just like in the Far East, maybe we need to to um, to get to get a higher relocation grant for uh, for regional doctors up to two million rubles and for paramedics up to one million rubles. I think that will be a good uh, stimulus. Um, we have um, already adopted the the federal budget, but maybe we can do that um, in the nearest future. Thank you. We see that colleagues cannot wait for the end of your response. Well, you you said that. Yeah, I promised. Uh, I think you're from Moldova, right? Yes. Please give the floor to the lady in red. Mr. Putin, my name is um, Anastasia Veltaeva. I'm from Moldova and we represent our multinational republic. I would like to invite you to our pavilion at the exhibition called Russia. Thank you, first and foremost, 
for this idea. What was the feedback? We took stock, and it seems that 97% of Russians are taking pride in their country after visiting the exhibition. Naturally, the regions have a lot to be pr proud of. Moldova is, is doing innovative um, manufacturing optic cable pharmaceuticals and naturally the calling card of Moldova, black diamond of our region is a specially treated oak tree. Well, it's, it's a possibility to, to take a look at the beauty of our region and well, this is an opportunity to solve matters with the business community and to solve other matters as well. I'd like to invite you there, and I would like to be present there as well. In the run-up to um, a new year, every girl dreams of a, of a miracle and even a big girl, so I'll, I'll be happy to be there. Yes, thank you very much for your invitation. Indeed, Moldova is a very beautiful republic. What I like is that the way the people treat their traditions their culture in all of its manifestations to the you know, traditional dress um, and traditions in the widest sense of the world. As for the regions and the exhibitions and the regional part of that, indeed, that that is a great success. The regional exhibitions at the VDNK are one of the most interesting for visitors and viewers. Yes, indeed, I'll try to, to get there. Thank you very much. So before we go back to questions from citizens. Let's go back to the media questions. I'd like to give the floor to Match TV. Something about sports. Um, yeah, I, well, if we can judge by the by the TV channel. Maria Korobova, Match TV channel. Naturally, it's about sports. We have a lot to, to discuss. IOC a week ago has um, stated very harsh conditions on um, given the, the chance for Russians to take part. However, the same does not apply to the Israelis. Do we need to, to go to the Olympic Games in this situation? And what is um, the general situation with the, um, with the sports of high achievements? I would also like to, to ask a question due to difficult conditions, difficult times right now, whether we'll continue that tradition of PE and sports development, especially in the regions. Before you can answer, you're you are into sports yourself, and you call judo your first love. That is truly so. We have a tremendous amount of calls from parents, from trainers, from the children themselves, that this, they have a lot of willpower to take part in the competitions. However, there is no place to train, well, not enough facilities for that. Let's, let's listen to the call from Crimea. Mr. Putin, we're talking to you from the sunny state where we have been to many competitions, to regional competitions. We have always won cups and medals. We have always trained in, a, in, this, in this facility, but this year it's impossible to hold competitions here. The walls are covered in fungus, so uh, the roof is leaking, so it's impossible to train here. And our trainers have applied everywhere. However, it was impossible to receive a solution. So therefore, we're training outside. Please, if you could renovate our sports facility. We'd like to be healthy and to be a pride of our city and region. Okay, I'd, I'd respond to, to the children, naturally, as for the IOC decision in comparison with other athletes coming from Israel and so on. Well, the first thing is that everything that international um, um, civil servants are doing in terms of Russia completely contradicts the ideas and spirit of Pierre de Coubertin, that sports is the world, and that was created in order to unite people and not on the contrary. The current international functionaries are too um, engaged in the, in the business, in the commercial side of the sports, and now they have fallen into dependence from sponsors that pay attention to the cost of one minute of commercials on TV and so on and so forth. There are plenty of internal issues as well. 
if they continue to act in the same way in the future, they will simply bury the idea of the Olympic movement and the spirit of Olympic movement. You've mentioned Israel and Israeli athletes. Despite what's happening in Gaza, well, if I supported this this notion right now, I will be uh, be the same as these uh, sports functionaries. Well, sports should be beyond politics, and it should unite people. Well, as we say that you should not count other people's money, so I think it will be unjustified to lay blame at someone else's feet. Yes, indeed, there are issues as well, as, as we spoke with your colleague just now. What, what does it have to do with the, with the athletes? Let them travel and, and train and, and, and compete and so on. The same should be done towards Russian athletes. However, that does not happen. Under the influence from the Western elites, they're making decisions that are beneficial to them and not beneficial to the global sports, just like European politicians are making decisions that are detrimental to themselves and beneficial to the U.S. The same applies here, whether we should go to the Olympic Games or not. Well, you know, we need to really consider what are these conditions, the, the flag, um, the national anthem, and so on. I, I've always been saying that the athletes are training for many years, and we should give them the chance to compete at the major events, including the Olympic Games. Everyone, known, everyone knows that, regardless of the flag, that this is uh, our athlete. It's apparent. That is why I supported our athletes traveling out and competing. But I think we need to analyze what are the conditions placed by the IOC. If these conditions are politically motivated and aimed at trying to prevent our leading athletes from participating, those who could be at the top uh, with gold, uh, silver, or bronze medals trying to hamstring our our uh, national team. Well, for example, if, if uh, athletes from the Army Club or from Dynamo cannot, be, cannot compete as they're allegedly connected to the armed forces, though today uh, the CSKA, uh, the Army Club, has nothing to do with the Army, and now it's a private private club. Well, if the idea is trying to get rid of our leaders and try to show that Russian sports are not developing, on the contrary, is withering, well, that means that the Ministry of Sports and the National Olympic Committee of Russia should analyze and to make a well-balanced decision. Yes. Mr. Peskov, well, you promised uh, a response to our children from Crimea. Naturally, I've noted it down. I, w I would like to address the children and say, indeed, we need to develop sports and all of our programs dedicated to that as well. Indeed, last year, last year I think 1.5 billion or 1 billion, 700 million was earmarked from the federal budget dedicated to regional sports. This year, we're not even reaching um, 700 million. We need to get back to that topic, and I think this should be a part of the uh, presidential program. I think it needs to be done. As for the specific matter in Crimea, I will speak to uh, the sports minister and so on, and as for the federal level, we'll give a targeted solution to this matter. Yes, there are a lot of um, such applications from two-man hockey and other types of sports. So, Mr. Peskov, giving you back the microphone, the National People's Republic will be um, looking at these applications throughout the year, as we have said. I see Dmitry Kulko, yet another military correspondent, um, very strange to see him in a suit with a tie. So, if you could please give him the mic. Dmitry Kulkov, First Channel, Military Correspondent, Mr. President, hello, hello. Several questions from the servicemen that are now in the 
war zone. Do you think that the system of payment to the serviceman is working fine and can it be improved? I know people that haven't received salaries for months. The second question is about the wounded servicemen and the foundation defenders of fatherland that was established to support the families of the uh, diseased personnel and how do you assess the operation of that foundation and, and a proposal a suggestion to make mr president if i'm allowed today servicemen that were wounded after hospitalization have to come back to to their squad deployment zone, so they have to come back to the military zone, and they may have been wounded gravely, losing limbs, and probably it would be better for them to go through this commission, medical commission, uh, in hospitals where they are treated. And the last question is about drones, aerial vehicles. We have a shortage of them, an acute shortage, and the the war, the combatants ask to provide more of that, but it's insufficient still. They, their numbers are insufficient. And not long ago, we collected money together with the uh, uh, People's National Front for the 4th Brigade around, that is fighting around Cliché of Kaimat has passed. And uh, these drones are consumables, and, you know, half of them is gone despite the jamming and the rain. We need more of that, and our 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 servicemen need need more drones because we need to improve the situation to provide reconnaissance and surveillance. You probably are observing that things are improving. Tell me, I'm right? It it has been improving, yes, but you know we need more. Well, it, well, it's it's been improving, which is for sure. But you are correct in saying that we do not have the sufficient quantities always, and uh, it's hit and miss. Please sit down. And the front line is two, around 2,000 kilometers long, around 2,000 kilometers long, and uh, definitely, obviously, for sure. Not all the supplies arrive on time everywhere, but we are ramping up our own domestic manufacturing, and we have been importing lots of things privately from from the abroad by the defense ministry. Well, and the, the defense ministry, the industry have been working hard to to improve the situation with respect to counter electronic uh, fight systems and anti-jamming systems. We have been installing a new system called Lesochek on all the vehicles. Uh, we'll keep bolstering these efforts. And as regards the, the bottom-up movement and the people's front participation engagement, this is a very good thing. And the government, the government and the state can, could do without this support. But, you know, we cannot stop that. We. We don't have a right to stop that, and I'd like to thank all our people for their heartfelt attitude and caring attitude, taking into account the need for the needs of the people and the servicemen fighting there. Around 10 billion rubles of donations. Definitely now our economy is on the rise, and we have the funds. But the the fact that you know. Uh, and all, uh, they knit garments and they send money and send letters, around three million letters from children were delivered to the front line. And we will be supporting that. I'd like to express my gratitude to all the volunteers engaged. Sometimes we have some disruptions in supplies, you know. We have regular meetings with the military correspondents, and you have been keeping a close eye at what is happening there. And I hope we will keep in touch with you, and you will submit all the data to me and the Defense Ministry. With respect to the need for the wounded servicemen to come back to the uh, to the 
stationing site to perform all formalities. I, I saw these questions in the letters, and probably the, the situation has changed. Either you have the, uh, some, the obsolete data, or I have imprecise data. As the Defense Ministry has said, now everything is possible. All the formalities may be performed in hospitals or rehabilitation facilities that are not on the front line, definitely. I will double check whether the efforts of providing accommodation and benefits is well are, are well established or whether they have to come back to the stationing site or not. I'll talk to the defense minister after after the press conf. It must be rectified if, if it's flawed. With respect to the Fatherland Defendants Foundation, it works very well. Very good people. Uh, it's a brilliant team, and I met one of their leaders, and wonderful, wonderful uh, people, a great team, very upbeat. But their, their scope is limited, you know, as per their statutory documents. They cannot take direct participation or be directly engaged. And I always was against them channeling and managing funds, but I am in favor at the same time to increase and enhance their rights with respect to the control of what is what amount is channeled where and what the outcomes may be in intra also in the area of rehabilitation. And uh, I will not delve into details now, but I know that the members of parliament, after visiting one of the uh, outlets of this foundation reported to me and we will improve the operation of that foundation so that it is a, a good tool to to uphold the interests of all the servicemen participating in the hostilities. You mentioned the huge and, and crucial role of the volunteers and the kind heart of them. Uh, lots of questions received from them. Uh, Madam Marina from the Moscow region asks as follows today. We, have, we see a lot of help from the grassroots to the military in procurement and supplies. Why do regular, why do rank and file people do that, not the government? You know, I have just answered. The government has been tackling that. 99.99% of all the efforts is the share of the of the government, uh, but still the the bottom up movement is heartfelt and will not uh, limit that. Well, the counter jamming systems, well, an assault an assault uh, fighter uh, asks to provide more uh, jamming devices. And you know, we may be lacking them in some these systems in some parts of the front line, in some segments of the front line, because uh, it's two, more than 2,000 kilometers long and 617,000 strong contingent is stationed there. So we might have disruptions in certain segments, definitely. But if you have specific cases, please provide uh, the data and. Uh, Myself and the military correspondents will watch that. Sergei Sobolev from Novosibirsk once again phoning in. Mr. President, Sergei Sobolev, on the 13th of November 2022, I concluded a contract with a private military group for six months. When I returned ho home, I came to the uh, defense uh, committee to receive the certificate of a veteran. And I moved to the, I turned to the foundation of Fatherland's defenders to receive the certificate. And I was declined. And in, in other instances, I also was declined. And please, will you sort that out? Because we all, myself and my comrades, served in this private military company. And we cannot receive the, uh, the veteran certificates. You know, I, I know about this system. These are the loopholes, the, the gaps that uh, should have been rectified by the defense ministry. 
Well, formally and legally, we do not have private military companies as per our law. This is number one. Number two, the contracts of the hostilities participants were not signed with the, with the state, but with the private companies. So commanders of those private military companies were, were related, were in, 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 in contact with the uh, government, and the payments were in cash. This is also a problem, and now it is very hard to pin down the exact lists of those military, private military groups. But I know all these people. I personally have some instances, like some, some of the children of my acquaintances participated in the warfare from representing these private companies. And among my milieu, there are people whose children are, but will have participated, and some of them lost their lives, sacrificing that for, for the motherland. Members of the private military groups, and with, without a doubt, their rights should be and must be reinstated. They are eligible to receive all the social benefits and allowances and all other forms of support granted to other participants of the hostilities. This is my categoric stance. I will not go into detail, but this must be done, and the Defense Ministry knows that as well as the government. If need be, or probably necessarily, we would have to amend the legislation, and this will be done, and I promise we will do our best. I'll go to length, to great lengths. Now let's call, I, I can see some running line. One of them has been saying, Yelpatyevo Yaroslav, Regent, please provide gas supplies. We'll have a look at that, probably we'll come back to that later, and, and we may speak about the gasification and Yelpatyevo uh, settlement in the Yaroslavsk, uh, Yaroslav region. And now we'll, we'll have a, um, a video call out to the village of Berozovo. Can you hear us? Good afternoon. I'm a, an, a service person now situated in Lugansk. Junior Sergeant Yulia Berozova. I always wanted to end up in Donbass as, as a volunteer on the 10th of May of 2022. I subscribed the Voluntary Mobilization Act and I was uh, ascribed to a, a regiment for the sake of defending our homeland and our and for the sake of justice, but I was mobilized in, in uh, the Donetsk People's Republic, not Russia. But, you know, I wanted to have all the benefits on site of my domicile. Uh, and I have a certificate of a, of a participant of hostilities in uh, Donetsk Republic, and it's valid only in, uh, in, in, the, in that republic. And uh, in the uh, federal database, my serial number, my personal number, is inexistent, so we, don't, we are not represented. We are invisible for, for the nation, uh, nationwide system. Uh, thank you for your question. You were recruited by the people's militia of Donetsk People's Republic. They are on the front line, on the contact line participating in the hostilities, and indeed the point is, the issue is that those who signed contracts when Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics were not part of the Russian Federation are 
are now in trouble. And uh, the issue is quite relevant. Well, uh, the junior sergeant is a uh, Russian national, uh, I know, and it's especially relevant for those who were not citizens of Russia. Now, the papers that you have pro make you eligible for benefits in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. They, these papers may be rendered valid on, on Russian soil. There is a procedure for that. Or you may receive a brand new package of documents on behalf of the Russian Federation. Now, a commission has been established in Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. They already operate. And uh, I believe that there have been about 4,500 people who have confirmed their rights. In the Lugansk People's Republic, there were 17.5 thousand people who also confirmed their rights. And in Donetsk, they have already issued the relevant certificates and IDs, a few thousand of them, in fact. And the same goes for the Lugansk People's Republic. 1,700 IDs have been issued. So we have already started moving along this path, and uh, we will keep working to restore the rights and confirm the rights of the war veterans. There should be no doubt about that. If something is not done yet, rest assured we will do that and we will finish it. And if there are any difficulties that you're experiencing when addressing the Commission, you can just tell us and we will fix it. Let's get back to the journalists, if I may. There is a young man next. Uh, wait, let's move to the north. There is a question there. Mr. President, good afternoon. Respublic Republic Komi, there is Chanina, the capital panorama, and member of the civil chamber of our region. This is a question that the people of the Northern Territories entitled me to ask. You know that. Unfortunately, all over the country, not only in our region, it takes quite a long time to implement a very important part of the program of the relocation of the people of the far north. We have six localities like that in the Republic of Komi. These are the people who have given their lives for the economic development of the north, and now they wish they could spend their retirement in territories with a more moderate climate. A few figures. This year, our Republic received 129 housing certificates from the state, but there are 21,000 people still in line for the certificates. I would, I'm not asking you to give certificates to all the people, but I see two options here. The first option is prioritize two categories of people, the disabled people and the retired people. These are the two categories should, who should be the priority. There are two options for them. Even though the federal budget is uh, quite pressed for money, but still I would ask you to seek additional finance for next year. If that's too complicated, our region is ready to get a low interest loan, and our authorities are ready to relocate the people of Irtim and Vorkuta, the people who live in these regions, to relocate them within the region, for example, to Siktivkar or to the south of Komi, where the climate is also quite acceptable. Would it be possible to choose one of the two options, or perhaps there are any third options? And thank you once again for solving our question of uh, giving the Vorkuta Airport uh, to the federal property status. Thank you for that. Th yes, and it's important that the airport get, is developing. Sometimes we give it to the region, and then the region starts asking for federal money for development. Well, the Republican authorities are very active, and the governor was asking you about that, and all the decisions have been taken. Yes, I know that the governor is very active, and he is, has good connections. He used to work in the federal authorities, and I believe he is quite efficient in that. I would ask you to repeat your proposal. So, you're suggesting that we prioritize two categories of people, the disabled people and the retired people. And so we see two options for them. The first, the easiest option, is seeking additional financement from the federal budget. The second option, 
that we would be capable of is relocating these people within our region of Komi, but that would need a low interest loan from the federal, federal budget to make sure we can solve their housing issues either with, in Siktivkar or in the south of Komi. The Republic is big, and moving from the north to the south of the Republic would also be a solution. You know, if we had a finance minister here, he would answer that we have no money and uh, the Minister of Finance never has any money for that. But still, we should seek a solution and uh, seek the expansion of the program. I know that there are people who have been working their entire life in the north, or at least some period of their life, and now they would like to move somewhere south or to a region with a more moderate climate. Of course, we will continue this program, most importantly. And secondly, speaking of expanding the spending and the budget, well, the budget for the next year has already been uh, adopted. Uh, if we have any additional income, we will consider this. Speaking of the relocation within the region, I think that's quite possible. We will talk about this with the head of the Republic and with the government. out a loan is also not quite simple, but this might be a form of providing assistance to the region. This wouldn't be so pressing for the finance ministry, although it uh, has certain difficulties for sure, but we will try to do that. And speaking of special priorities for the two categories, that's right. We will discuss that with the government. Thank you for your suggestion. Let us move on to that sector. The third row, a young man sitting over there raising his hand. Please introduce yourself. Vladimir Serokov, RBC channel. A couple of questions about the currency. Recently, Javier Milei became the new president of Argentina, and one of his main proposals before the elections is to use the US dollar instead of the Argentinian peso. Russia, on the other hand, has recently been uh, pursuing the policy of de-dollarization, not to use dollars and euros in international transactions. What do you think about the process? And how convenient is it for Russia to ensure transactions in rubles and the national currencies of the friendly states? And speaking of the Russian ruble, in your view, what are the factors mostly affecting the exchange rate of the ruble, its growth and increase? and decrease. What is it reliant upon? Let us begin with Argentina, not to get back later to that. Yes, we are all aware of the idea of the president-elect of Argentina to use the U.S. dollars within the country. This is a sovereign decision of each state. First of all, the inflation in Argentina is about 143%. And there are numerous problems. And even the previous authorities were talking about that they have issues with paying back the loans that had been issued to Argentina from various sources. So the logic here is clear. However, this would mean a significant loss of the national sovereignty. If the current Argentinian authorities see no other solution in this financial conundrum, the decision is up to them. However, this would mean a significant loss of their sovereignty. Now, the next point. There is also a social and economic component of such decisions. You're from the RBC channel. You specialize in these kinds of you're all specialists and experts. You'll know what I'm talking about, and the citizens will understand. There's nothing complicated in what I'm about to say. Even the use of the US dollar when calculating your national currency exchange rate may result in serious social and economic consequences. Back in the day, Argentina went through great turmoil relating to their finances and the banking issues. Now look what's going to happen if they only use the dollar or if they directly link their national currency to the U.S. dollar. They're trying to solve their domestic economic problems. And 
all governments are always taking into account their social obligations to the citizens. And by the way, I am satisfied to know that the Russian government is dealing with its obligation. Despite the rising expenses for the defense and security, we are fully compliant with all our obligations to the citizens, 100%. Some might say we're not doing enough and uh, more should be done. We were talking to the Republic of Komi about the problems with relocation and so on. But the fact that the state is giving its promises and we stay true to our promises. Now, speaking of the US dollar, they have certain obligations. The retirement benefits, the state employee salaries, and so on and so forth. Generally, there is not enough money. So what would it mean if they started using the dollars? They have their national currency, the peso, and a tool to affect the inflation. That doesn't work perfectly, but still they have the means to balance the healthy economy and their social obligations. Now, if they switch to a foreign currency, they can't print their own money. There is only one way to deal with the inflation, to cut the social expenditure, to cut it everywhere, to cut the salaries, to cut the retirement benefits, the medical expenses, the road infrastructure, the security, and so on. There is no other way if they renounce their national currency. And any government taking such decisions would find itself in a very complicated situation from the point of view of domestic political stability. If they're ready for that, that's their sovereign right. The country is independent and they may take their own decisions. Speaking of us, you see, we're rejecting that. We're not. However, we've been experiencing problems with the transactions in foreign currencies. And by the way, they're shooting themselves in the leg by doing that. They are blocking our access to the US dollars and the euro as universal reserve global currencies. First of all, the US dollars. In 2021, uh, if memory serves me right, we were servicing our experts and we were using 87% of foreign currencies in these transactions. So the US dollars and the euros. The ruble only accounted for 11 or 13%. And the Chinese yuan accounted for 0.4%. As of September this year, the figures are as follows. The rubles accounts for 40%. The yuan accounts for 33%. The overall use of the US dollar and the euro is 24%. It went down from 87 to 24. Why did they do this? They shot themselves in the leg. Is it bad for us? No, it's not. The more we use the national currencies in our economic transactions, the better for us. This increases our sovereignty and our opportunities. So what defines the exchange rate? The exchange rate defines on the market, it depends on the market conditions, on the price on our export goods, and it relies on the domestic consumption and domestic demand, which is growing. There is also one more aspect. Way. There was a decree that was meant to regulate the exchange rate situation, and it also played its own role and made the contribution. What was this about? In the previous years, it didn't take any restrictions. We used to have enough information from the countries that were receiving the majority of our experts. And it was clear for us where the capital is moving. 
Now, we do not receive any information. They closed everything for us. The government and the central bank do not see what is happening with the finances that our experts, those who experts, receive from exporting. The central bank and the government now have a legitimate desire to see how everything is accumulated, uh, uh, where money is moving. So these elements of control are being introduced. I think that everything is becoming normal and if everything is temporary. Well, but the situation, financial situation is stable and the main thing is to ensure this uh, stability and predictability. In my opinion, we are reaching this goal today. Let's have a question from the hall. We haven't uh, asked anyone from that sector. Can we ask someone from Kuban? Can I please participate also in this? Hello, Mr. President, uh, Zmutsky Maxine uh, from uh, Krasnodar territory. This year, the results of Kuban reached uh, a historical record. Uh, 17 and a half million tourists arrived to our region. It's only in summer, and now there is an active winter period. This is a burden for the infrastructure, first of all, to the transport because of the closed airports. Is there a plan, a federal plan, to develop transport access to this region, maybe railways, highways? Just uh, yesterday, there was information that on the 15th of December, tomorrow, there will be a test fly to the airport of Krasnodar. If everything is good, uh, our uh, Krasnodar airport will be opened. Uh, if, is it true? Thank you. Please sit down. As for the airports, the main criteria is security ensuring security of uh, people. This is an absolute priority uh, if we are speaking about uh, opening airports. This also goes for the airport in Krasnodar. It's uh, far away from uh, the war zone. The Ministry of Defense uh, has uh, this request. They're analyzing the situation to make a decision. If they're moving to this decision, they will inform me about that and we will act. But first, we have to see the situation and analyze it. As for the development of transport ways, development of aerial transport, railways, highways, everything is being developed. There are High speed, uh, there is a high speed uh, highway uh, that we are planning to construct. Uh, the first stage, uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and then we'll move to the south. Possibly, and we're thinking about this, uh, the main thing we have to do right now is to create an effective uh, structure that will deal with it, uh, that would create a good business model for development. Everything is possible. The government. Uh, and the initiators of this process are working on that, thinking about that. They are providing proposals. I'm speaking about uh, the Bear Bank. Uh, the government uh, is also uh, included in this work. If there is a, a highway between St. Petersburg and Moscow, it will take uh, a little bit uh, more than two hours uh, to get to uh, to the city and in Moscow people have more need more time to go from one uh, part to the other and as for the south uh, Krasnodar Kuban uh, Stavropol territory and other regions uh, Crimea uh, this is also important that is why we are working we are starting to work on this track and I hope uh, it will be effective in the future as for the development of uh, transport for the passengers, it is uh, rising. If we're speaking about uh, uh, passenger transport, a aerial uh, transport for passengers, it's uh, more than 16%. Uh, then go railway uh, transport, 10% um, more. 
And as for cars, uh, buses, uh, there is a rise of uh, 6.4, 6.5%. So the volume of uh, passenger transport is increasing dramatically. All those who participate in this process have to think about the uh, coming tourist season to do everything to ensure the interest of the people to develop the internal tourism. It is developing already at a good pace, and I would like to thank everyone who works in this sphere, those who work in Kuban. Thank you for increasing the quality of their work, and I hope it will continue. Let's have uh, one more question. Please, uh, uh, there is a, a person in the first row, uh, life. The first row, yes. Uh, Alexander Yunashal, life. Uh, uh, there are a lot of military correspondents uh, here, uh, and uh, it is demanded a lot from them. Uh, but there are some articles of the uh, code, criminal code, uh, for killing. There is 12 years, and sometimes uh, uh, 14 years are given to um, extortion on the internet. Uh, for instance, uh, let's take a, a history of journalists. Uh, th uh, there is a case um, uh, with the bank that uh, with the, with the banker Ushakov. Uh, so what are you saying? You are trying to justify this journalist? No, I'm not trying to justify anyone. I'm just giving the facts. Let's speak about your actions. Uh, um, maybe we should change some articles of the criminal code. Maybe we should uh, um, change uh, some the limits of the um, the limits. When is this a uh, limit? When uh, s the criminals are really punished, and when we are starting witch hunt? Well, I do not know all the details uh, of the situation. Uh, what has she done? What the uh, journalist by Zitova, what has she done? Maybe she was uh, um, working for the opposition. What has she done to hunt for her? No one is hunting her. Lawyers know that uh, law is dura est lex, and uh, the law is... Uh, die one and I know that um, there are different crimes uh, that and uh, sometimes 12 uh, 14 years are given to the people I know about this but I was really shocked it's too much and it is obvious in many countries uh, economic crimes uh, tax crimes uh, anti-monopoly crimes uh, fighting cartels, uh, these uh, uh, imprisonment terms uh, are being uh, summed up and uh, people receive up to 100 years. Why is this happening? Because the society and the legislators think that at some stage of the development of the society, of the economy, the social threat of these actions is uh, so big that Legislators think that uh, the adequate reaction is needed to stop such illegal actions. Let's take this case and other cases. I am a citizen and, and I also have questions. Why would we put someone, um, what would we imprison someone for 14 years? There was, a, there was an ex-minister and he received like 19 years of imprisonment for some um, uh, violations. What was done by him and by this woman is bad, but giving them 14, 19 years of imprisonment is too much. So legislators have to think about that. It is necessary to think about this. But there is still this law, and we need to implement it. We know there is a film that we love very much, the station, Belarusian station, where Papanov uh, represents an enterprise, and uh, he is always in confrontation with a young director. Uh, he asks him to violate some kind of instruction. And the hero of Papanov says, you're so young and uh, energetic. Maybe you are right. 
then go and uh, uh, make everything to cancel this instruction. And still, if there is this instruction, I'll do everything to implement it. The stability of the legal system is important, and the society understands uh, how it works and uh, how the society evaluates what was done. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't change anything. I agree with you. I'll ask the legislators, uh, the State Duma, to make another evaluation and to react. I agree with you. Mr. President, we're working live. Uh, we have been working for two uh, years. Let's just uh, mm, listen to other questions. Uh, they are not uh, usual ones. Uh, for instance, you're from St. Petersburg. Today, our country uh, and you personally are being insulted. For instance, uh, maybe in the future, a, a person from a German village will say, well, Putin was doing everything uh, correctly. And uh, what do you think about all the world that is against you? And uh, uh, have you ever pl played chess uh, uh, with someone uh, recently? And uh, what can you say about the celebrations? There are many questions. Uh, well, the first one was about a person from Germany. Another one was about stress, uh, about motivation, how you preserve it. Uh, and another question was about playing chess. Uh, have you played uh, chess with someone recently? And what do you recommend uh, the Russians to do during long celebrations? Why are only speaking about a German uh, town? I know that not only in uh, German towns, but uh, in many other towns uh, in Europe and the US uh, and other regions of the world, many people think that everything we are doing is correct. We are not afraid to fight for our national interests. And uh, we are not interfering into other interests. This is the first thing. We have a lot of supporters all over the world that support and protect our traditional values. There is a great number of them. And there are more and more of them. Uh, the number is rising exponentially. As for the stress, how to deal with it, how the, to deal with the situation when we are attacked, the sense of duty. I'm saying it without any pathos. I, during years, I have accustomed to the fact that we need to strive to choose uh, the main thing and do everything to reach uh, the objectives without paying attention to anything else. Of course, we uh, need to have a wide uh, uh, vision uh, to analyze everything, but we should be confidently moving to, towards our objective. I'm confident of what I'm doing. As for the chess, well, I uh, have recently asked a young boy, well, let's play chess. And he said, OK, let's do it. And I asked him, what do you think I will win? And he looked at me, well, not, well, possibly not. Well, not possibly. So we should always work and to improve. I'm trying to do that. What about the new year? I think we should pay attention to our family, do something together, find some common cause, uh, go to theaters, exhibitions, uh, do sports, uh, be active. And it's uh, good to spend this uh, celebration with the family. We receive a reaction to the questions that we receive. There is a call, uh, uh, Crimeans uh, that go to the governor's school, and they are ready uh, to go to the um, um, 
gym and to repair it in Crimea? I think the same response is expected to this matter. This is not a new topic. However, there are new manifestations. Um, the issues with higher prices for a certain product. It is very sad to buy eggs in uh, our country. Coming from Tomsk, Anastasia uh, from Ivana is asking whether this is a, uh, these are special golden eggs from a golden goose. And there is also a question from Krasnodarsky region. Dear President, my favorite president, my name is Irina Okopova. I'd like to appeal to you. I'd like to ask you to use your influence. Right now, a dozen of eggs is costing from 180 up to 220 rubles. Where are these prices coming from? Chicken breast used to be 165 rubles per kilogram. Right now, it's 350. Chicken wings, 165 today, 250. Please take mercy on retired people. We don't have millions uh, received in, in pensions. Please do something about it. It's too bad that you're doing this uh, only once a year. We need to have a th three times a year uh, hotline calling so that people can appeal to you. Thank you so much, and I hope that you'll help me. Dear Irina, you mentioned that we're doing this only once a year. However, believe me, I've just spoken quite recently to the agricultural minister asking about egg prices. They're saying that everything is fine with, the, with these eggs. And he spoke very honestly. And I said that um, citizens have issues with that egg prices, 40% price hike, uh, as well as chicken meat. Well, what happened is that we have a certain increase, and it's not that much, but increase in salaries. So there is higher demand. So that used to be a rather cheap source of protein. It's very popular. I'm, I'm very um, happy to eat a, a, a sunny side up um, I, I could eat a dozen of them at breakfast. Well, what happened is that there is greater demand. However, the production did not. Second, import um, was not um, allowed in the necessary on necessary scale. Now we have uh, proposals coming in from Turkey. We have good relations, especially economic relations and in the agricultural sphere with other countries. Belarus is offering. However, it wasn't opened in time. We need to do that within Eurasian Economic Union. And I think the decision was recently made and well, it will be done in December. And the situation, without a doubt, will improve. I truly hope that it will happen so because at least two weeks ago we had this conversation with the Minister of Agriculture. I'm very sorry. Uh, please accept my apologies for that. This is a, a shortcoming in the work of the government. Some people say that it's not so, but um, I do believe that it's, it, it is so that we did not um, allow for a greater scale of import, hoping that they can earn more money, I guess. I promise that the situation will come back. Utilities prices are also concerning our citizens. Some people are saying that the, the light at the end of the tunnel is now higher in price right now. Some people are saying that the, the utilities are growing higher than the pensions, greater than 7%. Okay, we'd like to Mr. President, in 2024, we retired people are going to have an, an increase of pensions by 7.5%. At the same time, since June 2024, Novosibirsk is going to increase the utilities prices from 9 up to 14%. That means those 7.5% will be annihilated um, as for our uh, increase in pensions. I'd like to um, 
um, give you the document proving that, coming from our governor. With respect, yes, well, uh, our counterpart did, did not pre present him, uh, Vladimir Leontiev. Mr. Leontiev, I agree with that. I'll look at the situation. I can see it on screen. Indeed, the utility prices, there is something happening in Siberia. We'll analyze the situation. Indeed, the pensions are going to be um, adjusted for inflation by 7.5%. hope that it will be higher than the infl inflation rate. But what, what I wanted to point out is that we have adjusted quite recently, I think in, in December 2022, we have adjusted the pensions by 10 percent, um, 10 something percent. Then in spring, there was yet another adjustment of 4.5 percent adjustment for inflation. And since the beginning of this year, we're going to have yet another increase by 7.5 percent. However, the utility prices were not um, increased since June last year, and the increase is planned only in July 2024. That means that the utility prices have been the same for 1.5 um, years, and there were five adjustments of pensions. And overall, that means more than 23% of pension adjustment. It seems so, yes. Naturally, everything should be done timely. The prices, utility prices should be increased step by step, and there should be advanced adjustment for inflation of the income of the citizens. There is yet another thing that should be noted here. There is a rule, according to the law, that if the utility expenses of a family, of a household, exceed 22 percent, then the household has the right to receive a subsidy. And hundreds of thousands of people have used this rule last year, in 2022. I think this year the same applies. In some regions, there is even a lower threshold, not 22 percent, but if the household is spending up to 15 percent of their income on utilities, 15 or 20 percent, they are, um, they, they can receive the subsidy. But we need to take a look at the parameters, what, what's happening in Novosibirsk. Of course, um, I'll, I'll do that. Is that correct that for a very simple service, utilities, you need to pay a commission to the bank. There are a lot of questions like that. Well, I don't think that's that's right, especially if it applies to retired people. The decision has just been made. The commission uh, should not be um, text coming from, from the retired people. That's, that's something new. I think we've forgotten about our audience here. Let's give the floor to the Baikal Amur mainline. You, 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 they will help you to hold the mic. Blagoveshenskiri, our gate to China, Irina Voroshilova from Amurska Pravda newspaper. Mr. President, our question is the following. Next year, we'll celebrate since 50-year anniversary of the construction site of the century by call Amur mainline. That used to be its name. Now, this main line is divided between two um, railways. Do you think that it's time to bring back uh, this um, BAM railroad? Now we have uh, BAM 2, BAM 3 railroads. They're very important for us. What, what do you mean to bring it back on the map? What, what do you mean by that? There is no BAM right now. There used to be, indeed, a, a BAM railroad. Baikal Amur mainline. That used to be this this the name, and now this mainline is divided between East 
Siberian Railway and part of Far Eastern Railway. So per se, there is no BAM on the map. And now there is an organization with hundreds of thousands of people from the post-Soviet space that I'm suggesting to create a Baikal Amur main line from Tashat station to Soviet Haven, and that would allow to speed up implementation of BAM-2 and BAM-3 projects and give beginning to building um, of new railroads in the east of the country. You know, I've, I don't think I've ever paid attention to the fact that for the first time I'm hearing that there is such an issue that BAM main line is divided between different railroads because still it's it all belongs to the um, Russian Railways company. The head of, of, um, of the company never mentioned that there was such an issue. Still, I'll, I'll have a conversation with him as well as Minister of Transport uh, Savelyev and with other people as well. If they think that it needs to be brought under one roof, I don't mind. I understand that making it one uh, main line from Taishat station to Sov Gavin station. Well, I understand the, the idea, but it should be initiated by the Ministry of Transportation or uh, the Russian Railways Company. No one ever posed this question. Well, it's okay. I'll, I'll have a conversation with the relevant authorities, with Russian railroads and with the Ministry of Transportation. I was never against it. If it's necessary, well, uh, why not do it? For the first time, I'm hearing that. Would it help? new construction projects. I, I don't think I really understand how it can um, help that. They're always having trouble trying to figure out who will be building what and on what conditions. Well, that uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister Kusnulin is responsible for that. In general, uh, I'm aware of what is happening. I hope that the work is being done. It's hard to do. The conditions are quite tough, but all the goals will be achieved. I promise you that I'll take a look at that issue, but it's the first time that I'm hearing that there is such an issue, especially if it's coming from those who were responsible for it, for, from the BAM community. Yes, the 50-year anniversary should be celebrated properly. Thank you very much. Can Let's re respect other people. Look. Take a look at how many questions need to be asked. Can we go back to BRICS Tatarstan? What kind of questions do you have? Our two Kalilur of Tatar Inform Media. As we know, uh, BRICS will take place in Kazan, in our city. The first question is, what kind of impact will uh, the BRICS will have on the rules-based world order? First and foremost, Western rules, as we understand. The second thing, the choice of Kazan, you know, the capital of Tatarstan. Does it have to do with the fact that now Kazan is becoming a certain diplomatic hub in relations with Eastern countries and the Muslim countries? Well, that's not the case. It has to do with the fact that Tatarstan is developing very well, and Kazan is one of the best examples of such development. The conditions, good conditions, have been have been created by the by the previous and president and the current president. There, Mr. Minikanov is working very well. I remember when I traveled with uh, with Mr. Shaimiya, we, we were looking at houses, and you know what made me happy back then. They, they couldn't even be called houses, but, but they were more like um, earth huts. So, well, but when we came in, it was very clean. I still have that uh, feeling of respect for the people who were living, living very modestly, but they were very clean and very organized. That's the level of, of the culture of people. It amazes me. Well... And it's reason for my respect. And I think it has to do with the, with the successful development of Tatarstan and the capital of Tatarstan, the city of Kazan. Undergoing steady development and being in a good state, shape with well-developed infrastructure, 
Kazan hosted a number of major international sports and political events. And naturally, it becomes a gravity center or a hub for multilateral meetings. And Tatarstan is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious republic with a well-established balance between the creeds. It is a uh, good model for the rest of the country. So this is why we opted for this city. And uh, with respect to the rules-based world order, these rules are inexistent because they change on a daily basis depending on, on political expediencies and uh, you know immediate interests of some of the stakeholders. How shall that impact the situation? Well, things will develop in the necessary, in the right direction. It will demonstrate that there are very many forces in the world, very many powerful nations that want to live guided not by the unwritten rules, but rather, on the contrary, by the rules of the United Nations Charter and other statutory tenets and being guided by the interests thereof and of their partners without establishing military alliances, create the context for effective, mutually advantageous development. This will be at the heart of Russia's presidency in BRICS. What airplanes, what aircraft shall we use to fly to that summit? Because it, a heavy blow was dealt to the aviation and aircraft construction uh, in past years. You obliged Russian airlines to buy and purchase Russian aircraft, and now they are queuing to buy these. But still, we are now using foreign-made aircraft. Is it safe? Because any, any, any news about an air incident or accident are... Uh, cause outrage. And now uh, a phone in from Tim Saltikov from Moscow. Can you hear us loud and clear? Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Maxim. I'm a cadet of the aviation school, military school. What is to happen with our civil aviation in the current geopolitical context amid sanctions and we, our airlines are not allowed to purchase uh, foreign-made aircraft, MS-21 and uh, IL-96 are 300 only being certified and it will take a lot of years for them to be commissioned and uh, the lifetime of the currently operating aircraft is coming to an end and another question, very few graduates come to work to our airlines, although we are trained for that and uh, in a nutshell, shall we fly in future and what? shall we use? What uh, aircraft shall we use? We will definitely keep flying. With respect to foreign-made aircraft, Pavel has been correct in saying that uh, we used to have disputes with our airlines that procured without any reasonable limitation too, too many of foreign-made airplanes. They had their own rationale because uh, they, 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 they cited the noise levels and the fuel consumption levels, Lo lots of arguments behind that. But probably it would have been better that proper market for Russian-made aircraft had been established. We have had some achievements, but our our fleet is overloaded with with foreign makes, and I think our companies acted correctly. They did not respond to the unlawful action on the part of the leasing companies and operators, but no one wants to lose money in part of these aircraft. We repurchase, we buy them back, and uh, they become the property of Russian airlines. We also need to enhance our own capability in aircraft building, and I hope that all the plans of ours, and we have around 1,000 aircraft in the pipeline until 2030, MS-21 
and uh, re-equipping the current aerial vehicles with, with Russian-made engines, PD, and uh, we should start manufacturing PD-35 engine with more powerful thrust, and we will have the opportunity to Im- increase the number of long-range aircraft, including AL-96-400, which already is in operation, the cargo version of it. It's a bit longer, so we must work hard, and we have the potential to implement all our plans. I hope that we will deliver on all of the plans of ours, and we will have aircraft at hand for the pilots and passengers. And with respect to small scale or regional aviation, we also must develop that capability. A question from the from the room, from the hall. I saw New York Times. Please will no no Lin Sing Hua first and then New York Times. Good afternoon, Mr. President. It's my pleasure to ask you a question. Xinhua, Chinese news agency. Two questions to you. The first one, as we know, Russia is to preside in BRICS next year. What meaning, what importance does cooperation and coordination between BRICS and uh, Russia and China in BRICS have? And what do you expect from the development of the Chinese-Russian ties next year? Well, we know. Please uh, have a seat. We know, and I have to repeat, that our level of interaction with the PRC is unparalleledly high, and uh, we hope to reach $200 billion of mutual trade next year. It's going to be on top $200 billion, even probably shortly this year, early next year. And in the first quarter, we will attain the $220 billion of of bilateral trade. And the increase will be 31%. It was 31% last year, and and the growth will be 30% this year. We have been pursuing our economic ties in various sectors steadily. We have been diversifying our ties. We have been developing infrastructure and bridge building and high-tech cooperation also. And we will act in this vein. And an incentive An impetus was provided during the March visit paid by the President of China, Xi Jinping. And we agreed that we would develop relations in eight main areas, and we signed the relevant documents. And the government of Russia and that of PRC start implementing our plans that we designed with uh, my friend and a friend of our country, President Xi, actively. We have been working intensively, stably, reliably. As regards BRICS, well, I will not say anything new. This vector has been reinforced, and the Russian-Chinese ties are one of the main guarantors behind the global stability. We see what has been happening around Russia and China, and we see some attempts of the West to switch NATO eastwise, and that definitely is uh, beyond their, their statutory school. North Atlantic is called North Atlantic. Why do they want to come to Asia? 
Still, they do. They're trying to in- instigate and incite the situation. They're establishing new political alliances and military alliances and, you know, with different makes, makeups. Us in China don't do anything of the kind. We do cooperate in the military sphere, in the, econo- in the economic and humanitarian sectors also, but we do not establish any alliances, and our friendship is not meant against third countries. It's to benefit us, most importantly, not anyone, not, not being against anyone else. What we see from the West, well, they're trying to make friends against someone, and we have been watching that closely, and we will respond on time and effectively. There should be no doubts about that. And uh, now, New York Times, as we promised, it will in the middle. The New York Times. Mm-hmm. New York Times. Gary Hopkins, for more than a year, Western correspondents and journalists could not attend such events, and I'm so glad that we can participate. It's all Peskov's fault. But let, but let me please, uh, I'm a person. I'm a democratic man. Well, we'll be talking that. We'll be discussing that. Can I uh, ask a question in English, please? My colleague, Wall Street Journal correspondent Evan Gershkovich, has been held in Lefortova prison without a trial for 37 weeks. His detention was today again. Uh, his, his, the extension on his detention was today again upheld. Uh, Paul Whelan, another U.S. citizen, has been in prison for nearly five years. A spokesman for the U.S. State Department, which considers both men wrongfully detained, recently said that Moscow had rejected what it called a substantial offer to return both of them to the United States. Is that true? Uh, What will it take to bring them home? And do you think that finding an agreement with the United States to bring them home to their families can be a way to improve the severely strained relations between the United States and the Russian Federation? Thank you. Well, you have mentioned that your uh, colleague from an Austrian agency, and and, and, and Austrian was an Austrian, or Austrian journal, journal. Well, he is detained without trial. He has been in detention without trial, and you said that his. Detention was extended. That was done upon the uh, upon a ruling by the court. So it would be appropriate to say that it was done without any trial or court intervention. So there is some court ruling behind that. With respect to uh, possible returning home or extra extradition of these two men back home, why not bring them back home? Why should why have they committed? on Russian soil. They ought not to have done that. Well, it's not that we decline to send them home. No, we want to come to terms, and these agreements must be mutually acceptable and should be okay for both of the parties. And uh, we have contacts with our American partners on that. We are in touch with them, and uh, we pursue dialogue. It is not at all easy. I will not delve into detail, but I think that we speak the language that both sides understand, mutually understandable language. I hope we'll find a mutually acceptable solution, but the American side should also listen to us and and, uh, Make a decision that would be satisfactory for the Russian side also. Well, well uh, humanitarian grounds must underlie, underpin these, uh, these, these agreements and decisions, definitely. I agree with you. Mr. President, now we are in the winter and switching and swapping from a topic to another, and everybody is ailing, and the, our Russian medical uh, agency has been registering an upswing in COVID and measles, and measles measles has become 300 times more active, the incidence of it, and um, probably there is a a shortage of vaccines. And a letter from the Samara region that they don't have vaccines against measles and other diseases for more than three for more than four months. 
and a lot of our nationals need Western medicines that are not available here, and there are sometimes no analogs, no substitutes, and how can we adapt and whether we receive, uh, whether we are successful in that or not. Thank you. Speaking of the vaccines for measles, parathysis, and rubella, I think that this is a quite a technical problem that we've been experiencing, and this is quite regrettable. Here's the reason. The reason is related to eggs, as well as it may seem. The measles vaccine production is based on the use of uh, egg protein, and to ensure the sufficient supply for the medical production, we need high-quality raw materials, and we need access to that. And we didn't ensure that in due time. That's the first point. Now, second point. The decisions have been taken, and I think very soon this will stop being a problem and the solution will be made. You mentioned the, the three-component vaccine for measles, cerebral, and baritis, and uh, yes, I think the solution will be found as soon as possible. There is no problem with the vaccination in the vaccine supply. A solution will be found very soon, and by the way, the surge in the measles is seen all over the world, and it happens every four years. What is the reason? Unfortunately, the reason is the low level of vaccination in the countries of origin of labor migrants, including Ukraine, since millions of people have moved from Ukraine into Russia. The vaccination level in Ukraine is very low. It was like that, and now it's even lower. And that's an actual problem for us. And there was our own technical issue that we experienced. But I hope, and I was told, and I'm being told by our specialists, that solutions have been found. Yes, we know that a number of companies have left the Russian market, and that is a problem. However, among the vital medications, I think there is a list of 14 positions on the list. And the, our industry is active. We're not closing down the imports of medication. Our healthcare ministry and the government are aware of the problems. A special commission has been established on the import substitution. The commission is active, and the commission assures me that they understand the situation, they are doing and will do everything to ensure the interests of the people who require certain medications. Speaking of the substitution, yes, sometimes uh, certain medications don't work for a certain person. The industry should be working, the doctors should be working. Sometimes there are certain psychological changes when people get used to a certain type of medication or a certain brand name, but it's important that a person can trust or believe in a certain medication. We will produce our own positions. We will not rely wholly on the imports. The primary health care is also important. You are mentioning the large cities and small cities, that there is a lack of doctors and uh, nurses. Let's call Yegor Permina from the Sverdlovsk region, from the Rechtinsky village. Yegor, if you hear us, please ask your question. Hello, distinguished Mr. President. My name is Yegor. I'm from the Sverdlovsk region, Rechtinsky village. We have a problem in healthcare, or rather lack thereof. The authorities are actively pursuing the infrastructure projects, but not the hospitals. The hospitals in complete ruin. The salaries and the condition are very poor. Most of the buildings were built in the Soviet times and they're collapsing in front of our eyes. We cannot receive good medical care. We're asking for your help. This was the Sverdlovsk region. I will look into that, definitely. I will see what we can do. This is the village of Rechtinsky, not far from Yekaterinburg. I will write it down. We will deal with that. There is a program. A program for the primary health care system. 
we're allocating quite a big deal of financement. We have already bought 14,000 medical vehicles. We are building the primary care facilities, and uh, I think the volumes are still not enough, and we will extend the program. This is a part of the future presidential program. We will extend the program to ensure the improvement in the primary health care system. Yes, we will do that. Much has been done already, in fact. Judging by what we see now, we're not doing enough. Let me repeat. We are aware of the problem, and it is no accident that we created a specialized program to improve the primary health care system, and we will continue pursuing it. In this regard, it is most important to pay special attention to the and the program says this, too. We have to pay special attention to the rural areas. More than a half of all the financement of the program goes into the rural primary health care, and we will keep doing that. And we will take your address and your suggestion into account. Let's get back to the journalists. Let's take a question from RT on this side. They are sitting just at the edge, quite unnoticeable. Thank you, Mr. Peskov, Mr. Putin. Thank you, Murad Gazdeev, Russia Today TV channel. A relevant question for us as an international TV channel and a question relevant for our multi multinational country. What do you think of the growing nationalism both in Russia and all over the world? not just nationalism, but also anti-Semitism. This is not a problem on the front line. In the trenches, we have people all together, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and they all work together. But as soon as you leave the war zone, you see this, both in Russia and all over the world. You see this as a current pressing issue. What should we do, Mr. Putin? You know, there has been a recent public poll by the Russian Center Please take your seat. The polls say that 96% of the Russian citizens believe that the interconfessional and interethnical agreement in our country is a great competitive advantage of Russia compared to other parts of the world. And it is true. First of all, this is due to, yes, I'll go back to the topic of our traditional values. This is, first of all, due to our traditional values. The traditional belief systems make a great contribution in preserving the situation, in preserving the relations between the various ethnicities and religions. Speaking of the spike in anti-Islamism sentiments, anti-Semitism and Russophobia and other sentiments like that, I must say that it is true that these trends are on the rise. And here's the reason, as I see it. I believe that the people are experiencing certain types of injustice. Take a look at Gaza. All over the Islamic world, there's been a certain reaction, and therefore, there has been a surge in the number of people who are quite radical. The growth is apparent. The numbers are growing. There's nothing good about that, rest assured, but still, this is the result of the policy of certain elites. This is the result of the issues of justice, and or rather lack of justice for the Palestinian issue for decades. The reaction of the Islamic world and therefore the growth of certain phobias, this is very bad. In our country, as I mentioned, 
the confessions, the traditional religions and values play an important role, but still, it is also important to remember that we are pursuing a balanced domestic policy as well as a balanced international policy. And we are doing what we can in order to ensure justice in all the areas. And I believe that the people really appreciate that. And that is why the situation in our country is also balanced. Speaking of anti-Russian sentiment, this is one of the vectors of the fight against Russia. Yes, this is a thing in the world. Domestically, we should do everything to ensure this doesn't appear in our country. We should immediately stop any attempts to destabilize the society from within. And that's what we've been doing. TF1, I think, is that the French TV channel? Yes, TF1. In the middle sector, please. been in contact for a very long time with uh, Emmanuel Macron. Could you tell us how do you perceive uh, France and its president today? Do you plan to meet him once again? On what, uh, on what uh, terms? No, no. Yes, we have and we used to have very good working relations with them. I visited France and Mr. Macron visited Russia. We have always had a very rich agenda, both bilaterally and multilaterally. And we are ready to continue our cooperation with France. But at a certain point, the French president seized all relations with us. We didn't stop it. I didn't. He did. If there's an interest, we're ready to pursue that. If there is no interest, we can do without them. That's it. There is nothing unusual here. We are not avoiding any contacts, rest assured. But if the European countries and the French president in particular are unwilling to talk to us, there is no issue here. If he says no, it's fine for us. We have our own things to do. If they're interested, we are ready. We have the Komsomolska Pravda. No, let's go to the Magadan region instead. And please, do not be so loud, or we will have a, quite a mess here. I'm sorry, but practice shows that this works. Thank you, Alexander Orlov, Column Up Loose Channel, Magadan region. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President. First of all, let me know that the region of Magadan can really feel the support of the Russian government. We see that the federal projects in our region are being implemented, and this has a positive effect. And this has a positive effect on the attitude of our population towards the president. And this also affects my own sentiments. We all support your decision to run for the election next year. As long as I remember, you've always been in power. I could say it like that. Thank you. Now let me move to the question. The first question is as follows. For our region, it's important to feel connected to the rest of the country. Few people from the Far East and the Magadan region can spend their vacation in their own region. But there are certain difficulties. Magadan has three subsidized travel directions to Petropavlovsk, to Blagoveshensk, and to Moscow. However, Khabarovsk and Novosibirsk are not part of the subsidized travel programs, and a single trip can take over 24 hours, and it can be quite costly for us. For example, it's much cheaper for us to go come to Moscow rather than to Khabarovsk, which is very close to us. And people like me, who have no children, have no disabilities, uh, and uh, those who are older than 22 do not get any discounts. I suggest that you get some children to get your discounts. That's the solution, I think. Then you will have access to the reduced rates. You're, you're such a nice young man. You, I don't think you'll have issues. Oh, thank you. 
So, coming back to my question, would it be possible to expand the number of subsidized travel routes from the Far East? I think this would also help us improve the tourism. So that's the first question. And the second one, I think everyone from the North and the Far East can tell that we also receive the additional benefits to our salaries. That's no secret. And the regions are choosing their own benefits. But overall, it takes about five years to get the maximum benefits. We people who were born and who work in the Far East, uh, as well as the experts that come to this region, have to reach this co if co coefficient. We do not receive it. Can we return to the legislation that existed before? Those who were born in the Far East and in the extreme north uh, uh, could receive uh, this co coefficient. Could we return to that legislation? Yes, I understand this uh, question. It is being discussed in the government. This is what I would do. I wouldn't uh, wait for the term or, or for working or living in the region. It would uh, make people stay in the forest, which is useful uh, for the country, and Russia needs it. This is just the problem of uh, the fiscal capacities uh, uh, and the federal budget. We will think about that. I'll ask the government uh, to return it to the agenda. As for the plain tariffs, they will be prolonged. It is usually done at the end of the year after my consultations uh, with IRF, first of all, and other companies uh, with the Ministry of Transport. We will prolong uh, these tariffs. I understand you very well. It is. Uh, it would be good to widen them. It uh, will require additional financing from the budget. We will think about this, but we will prolong it, rest assured. But the volume is uh, enormous, uh, the, and the forest uh, is uh, an entire world, separate world. It's uh, the, the distances are so big that it is really hard to move around the region, but we'll try to solve this problem. Thank you. I see Veliki Novgorod. The, there is a, a woman sitting there, and well, she, she has nothing to do with it. Natalia Khmelyova, um, the regional TV. We have a question about health care in our region. The situation is improving. Uh, we are buying equipment. Uh, um, young experts are being supported, but a considerable part of mortality is uh, connected to the cardiac diseases, heart diseases. There is a question about federal program. Maybe we could create a federal problem to create heart centers in this region. It could be very good for our regions, and I think our other regions will support us. We could not. We cannot do it without federal support. I'll talk to uh, Sergei Nikitin with the governor and with the Minister of Health Care. Maybe we will not create a separate uh, program for heart diseases. We have a special program for oncology, and it is functioning. But uh, one of, uh, heart diseases is one of the uh, problems, uh, one of the reasons uh, of high mortality. We will look into that. The first thing we need to do is to prolong the program related uh, to the development of the primary health care. And maybe uh, in this program, we will have uh, special um, uh, special programs, uh, small programs for the people uh, with the risks of such diseases uh, uh, to treat them, to provide rehabilitation. We'll look into that. Minister of Health Care is really concerned about heart diseases and is working on this issue actively. And now the uh, rate, mortality rate is getting lower. We'll look into that. Uh, Komsomolska Pravda, please give uh, the microphone. Alexander Gamov, uh, Komsomolska Pravda, uh, radio and uh, website. Thank you for supporting uh, the initiative of uh, 
uh, Mr. Zanin, a, mil- a military uh, correspondent who is now in Donbass, he proposed uh, uh, to use the authority, the experience, uh, and the knowledge of uh, the heroes of uh, the special military preparation to be used to use it uh, in the patriotic education of our children. Well, my question is, why, uh, Mr. President, we need a new history book uh, for teaching at schools? What is the difference? Well, this is the first question. Next year, we are going to celebrate uh, eight years of the end of uh, Leningrad blockade, ten years since uh, the reunification with Crimea. In the 2025, 80 years of uh, the Great Patriotic War. Personally for you, what uh, all of these uh, events mean? Well, and as I have a microphone in 2025, it will be 100 years of Komsomolska Pravda, and we invite you for the anniversary. Maybe you could uh, uh, ask uh, your press secretary to include it into your schedule, and we will wait for you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, we'll have to wait for the 2025. Uh, well, uh, historically, it's not so far away. But uh, if I'm speaking about a person, it will, well, it's quite far away, but thank you. As for the anniversaries, I'm sorry, it's because of the air conditioning. As for the anniversaries that you mentioned, It's not only for me, but all the people in Russia, all people of the former uh, USSR, all of this is of great uh, significance for almost every Russian family. This also has a a personal meaning. For instance, in the cemetery of Peskarova in St. Petersburg, uh, uh, my uh, elder brother is uh, buried. I have never seen him. Uh, because I was born much later. But it is also meaningful for me personally. Well, the first part, what was it about? I... You were thanked to, to, for supporting the initiative by Sergei Zenin. I just thanked you um, from in the, on behalf of Komsomolska Pravda for supporting Sergei Zenin and his initiative. Uh, those who fight in the special military operation should be used in peaceful for peaceful uh, objectives. Uh, they could go to schools. Uh, for instance, um, um, it would be, be very good for a patriotic education of children. We shouldn't. We, I cannot add anything because uh, wars are won by teachers. If you're speaking about education uh, and about uh, those who have uh, risked their lives uh, fighting in the war, uh, fighting for our motherland, it, motherland, it's uh, very important. In Leningrad, we had teachers uh, who participated in the Great Patriotic War. And we had a lot of respect to them, to what they said, how they behaved. This is the greatest greatest example. And we're going to use this opportunity. And now the question was about uh, the history book. Why do we need uh, this? There were 60,000 or 65,000 versions, and in many of these uh, books, and uh, those uh, the Russians will understand, because we were speaking about the anniversaries related to the Great Patriotic War, in many books uh, there was anything, there could be anything. 
for instance, the significance of the second front. But nothing was said, or almost nothing was said about the significance of the Stalingrad battle. Isn't it all, is it all right? We need a fundamental public state version that should be presented to everyone and should be used by everyone, those who print it, those who read it, because first we're speaking about children and then about citizens. It's extremely important. We needed this school book. And there were questions, there were those who were criticizing it. All right. Yes, uh, teachers and scientists should together work on this. Or they also should work with the parents. They should think about this, develop it, uh, introduce changes, knowing the realities, uh, the relevant ones uh, of what is happening now, preserving uh, a, an approach, a good approach to our, the historical events of our country, because we had, as any country, many internal problems. So we should be kind about that. And all these school books should be truthful. They shouldn't serve any other's interests. Well, uh, th this is something new for a direct line. The people started, stopped uh, um, saying that they have problems with the roads. Uh, uh, instead, they're saying that everything is good. For instance, they're speaking about the, high to the highway to St. Petersburg and uh, others. But people have many questions about uh, uh, riding over roads where you have to pay and uh, the prices are very high. Why is it so expensive? And we have a call. Hello, Mr. President. My name is uh, Sergei. I have from Moscow. I have a question about uh, tariffs uh, for a road between Moscow and Kazan. The t tariff on this highway for a car is around uh, seven rubles for a kilometer. And uh, uh, it will be 6,000 uh, rubles for, coming, for going from Moscow to Kazan, and this is costly. Um, uh, before, Afterdor was saying that it will be 4 rubles for a kilometer, and uh, it would cost uh, three or 4,000 uh, rubles to go from Moscow to Kazan, and I think it's uh, uh, reasonable. Please, uh, Mr. Putin, could you uh, give uh, orders uh, to uh, the... Um, organisms that are responsible for that uh, to ensure re reasonable prices for tourists. Thank you very much. Sergey, yes, is it your name? Y yes, it is. Sergey, well, I don't know uh, why, why I'm speaking about this figure, 6,000 rubles. Was it published? Uh, for instance, uh, uh, if we multiply it, we receive 5,600 rubles to go from Moscow to Kazan. Well, uh, the price should be 4,500 4, rubles. I will check it. Maybe we shouldn't just uh, multiply it. Um, I will check it. Uh, thank you for the question. If we're speaking about Crimea, it costs less than 4,000 rubles, and uh, the distance is very uh, long. As for St. Petersburg, it's also four, four and a half thousand rubles. Well, it's uh, very good that the, those who live in Moscow think about Kazan. It's uh, so harmonious. I'll repeat, I do not understand why are you speaking about 6,000 rubles? Because we, uh, it was promised to have 4,000. Yes, I understand, but uh, that is what we received, multi multiplying it. Thank you very much. In general, um, toll roads uh, can be toll roads uh, if uh, only if there is an alternative because uh, there is an opportunity to not pay for the road and to go for free. But those who construct roads uh, try to do everything to 
make them not so costly. For instance, there is a bridge that is going to be built, and uh, before that there was uh, um, a ferry. Uh, it will cost uh, 270 rubles to go uh, by to go over this bridge. So I'll ask uh, those who construct roads to work in this direction. I will check it. Mr. President, since we've started talking about roads, uh, when we came here with Pavel, um, at traffic jams, rush hour, plenty of Chinese cars, it's a true expansion, so to speak. And experts are saying that almost 60% of our market have been conquered by um, the Chinese cars. They're not cheap, however, ours are also on par with them. And our citizens are asking why um, the prices for Russian cars is, are exorbitant. I think they have increased by 40 percent. Well, basically, there are no middle class uh, cars, n- nothing under one million rubles available. Well, 40 percent is quite a lot as well, I understand. I think it's unnecessary to explain everything, but still, um, if there is such a question, I'll explain. When the European brands left Russian market, European, South Korean, and Japanese as well. There were several issues at hand. They left with spare parts as well. And the question was about developing our own industry. I have to say that Russian Avtovaz is coping with the the quantity, but the, the more they produce, the lower the price. Some costs have to do with the fact that this way or another, another, the producer is getting international spare parts, but at a different price. That is leading to extra costs. Besides, the small amount of cars produced, the greater the amount, the less it will cost. I think that Aftavas is following this path, and I hope it will bring about decrease in prices. But most importantly, we need to create our own platforms and develop them. We have Aftavas and other producers. They're doing that, but it takes time. I'd like to hope, and I'm even positive that this will take place and the prices will go down. The second very important matter is creating our um, spare part production, our own, because we have over-trusted, so to speak, our so-called partners. And the spare parts industry has been completely lost, and we need to rebuild it. And our industrial ministry is doing that. This task is, is, is being solved. I, I'm trying to be very cautious because if I say it will happen tomorrow, but they won't manage to do it, they will say that I've promised something and didn't deliver. But I'm trying to assure you that our industrial ministry is working very actively as well as producers. And I'm happy that we'll be able to achieve that. And Lada Granta is under a million rubles. Uh, a bit, well, a 40% growth is quite a lot. Everyone wants to uh, have an ours, I think. It's very expensive. Well, it's been produced in very small amounts. However, it's been produced abroad as well in the United Arab Emirates. The assembly is located there. Our Emirati friends like that car, along with other producers as well. We have um, a range of limousines and sedans and jeeps and, and buses, and we have we have it all, but we just need to, to start. We need to have um, serial production, then the price will go down, but it takes time. Mr. Peskov, you have the floor. In any case, you know, what, what, what I would like to highlight is that those who thought that will collapse, I think they're disappointed. Nothing collapsed. It's for Chinese cars, right? Our Chinese friends, they know what happens. It's typical not only for Russia. Chinese producers are very active on global markets, and they've started 
to substitute European brands, including in the European markets. Look at what's happening in car manufacturing cities, for example, in Wolfsburg. Unfortunately, the situation is deteriorating there. E-cars are being produced and sold more and more. American plants are being opened there. Where are the interests of European and especially German car manufacturers? That is unknown. Several years ago, there was a, an attack conducted against Volkswagen, and it was very detrimental. So what does the government do to defend their traditional car manufacturing industry? German and European, well, they did nothing. They were left to their own devices. The Chinese government is working very actively in supporting their car manufacturing industry, and they're pressuring the Europeans away from the markets. It's happening not only in Russia. The quality is on the rise as well, and the price-quality ratio gives an opportunity to our drivers to, to choose what they want. We'll be working on that together. A young man straight ahead of me, he's raising his hand. Yes, yes, it's you. No. Mr. President, well, it's too late. I wanted to give the floor to a different one. I'm very sorry. Yes, please, go ahead. Yes, I'm very sorry. Saga, Novgorod region, Veliki Novgorod, I'm talking about the power uh, transmission lines which have been built uh, post-war. They have been, they have become outdated. Right now, the transmission lines um, at 70 percent of their capacity, and just with a little snowfall, whole regions can be left without power, with thousands of people left without power. That happened in December 2021, and some people were left without power for two or three weeks. Andre Nikitin, the governor, spoke to you, increasing the capacity of the grid, you supported his appeal. In 2022, an agreement was signed between Rossetti Company and, a, and the government of the region. Six billion rubles were earmarked for that. They were going to update transmission lines and to buy the necessary equipment. Since then, more than a year passed and nothing changed. I wanted to ask you how soon the energy sector will start delivering on your promise, and we can improve our grid. Rossetti are working rather actively all over the country. What was planned specifically, 6 billion rubles, I, I, I won't lie to you. I don't know what was planned there. I'll take a look at that. Naturally, I'll talk to the leadership of Rossetti and with the governor. We'll try to help people to support the implementation of the plan. We have a tremendous grid in Russia. I mean our tremendous territory. Well, this is the European part of the country. Yes, there were some shortcomings, and it is snowing very strongly. They have certain plans per region and territories. I will, I'll find out, you know, and we'll speak with Andrei Nikitin for sure. I'll try to help you. Yes, the, the young man, please. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Mr. President, my name is Alexander Zarubin. I'm known as Alexander Stone. I'm an uh, actor from Gazprom RD Holding inside People Production Center. I'm a blogger. Right now, this sphere is developing rapidly, especially in the recent years. It experienced tremendous growth. Information, new platforms, um, opening up closing down, and so on and so forth. I wanted to ask you a question about the future of our sphere, what I personally can do for us to continue working and developing, creating, so that our work would be completely transparent, so there won't be any questions to us. Well, if there are no questions, well, well there is no conversation then. Well, this is a, a free sphere, right? It's very free. The most important thing is for the state not to stand in your way. If that's happening, um, tell us. We'll try to amend it. 
But if everything is developing the way you, you think is the right way, well, God give you strength and health. We'll try to create the atmosphere and the situation for the development of the blogging sphere. The only thing I'd like to ask is just, it's just a wish. We understand that there is responsibility for people who are working in this sphere because there is no control from the state, no oversight, but we need to to have an understanding of corporate ethics and, and you know, self um, limitation. You know what I'm talking about. It has to do with um, ethics, uh, safety, um, safety of children, and so on. It's, it's very clear. It's very understandable. So it's better when a professional community is organizing itself, just like it that happened in, in high tech and so on and so forth. If you have certain wishes, uh, please put them on paper. We'll, we'll try to respond. I, I can hear. There are people who gain popularity very fast, but they don't have people who have um, experience with businesses. They don't know how to register themselves as entrepreneurs, how to pay taxes. There are a lot of young people. They don't feel this responsibility. So what I would like to have is that for a majority of people who are working as bloggers to have certain hints for them to be shown the ropes and will be treating our work responsibly and continue to create. Yes, to have chaperones, uh, guidance, to have guidance, that is very important. You have highlighted the highlighted something that should be a government priority. I've heard you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe one more question from the audience because I see Mir. Mir is a, is a tremendous CIS space. Thank you very much, Mr. Peskov. Good afternoon, Mr. President and colleagues. Elina Dashkova, Mir Company. In 2024. The chairmanship in CIS goes to Russia. And in Bishkek on the 13th of October, you said that Russia intends to work actively to follow up and support the authority of the Commonwealth. But the thing is that Moldova is saying that they possibly will leave the Union, the Commonwealth. And Armenian Prime Minister Mr. Pashinyan is ignoring the How critical on integration associations in post Soviet space. Thank you. We're building all of our integration plans, and I mean Russia, purely on the basis of of it being voluntary and mutual benef- mutually beneficial. As for Eurasian Economic Union, there is consistently growing trade. Capital labor markets are opening up um, the flow of workforce, supporting of mutual cooperation, efficient, efficient use of um, Soviet heritage meaning we have uh, one transportation infrastructure and so on, that we have the language of international and ethnic communication. Mr. Tokayev presented initiative to create an international association to support Russian language, and we are thankful to him for that. These conditions are increasing our competitive edge on global markets and also helps solve issues in not only in economy, but as an end result in social sphere and improving the welfare of our citizens. If Moldova does not want to be a part of that process, well, that means that this is the choice of their leadership. Let it be so. Moldova is one of the poorest countries in Europe. Quite recently, it was the poorest country in Europe. Now, Ukraine has taken over this honorable spot. Well, if the poorest country in Europe is teaching us or is, is receiving 
energy for, at, at low prices from Russia. And if it wants to follow the example of Germany, where they're receiving U.S. energy 30, at 30 percent higher rates than previously from the Russian Federation, well, if they have some extra money, let them do so. The same applies uh, to other dimensions, for example, agriculture. The produce <clears throat> markets are used The Russian the Russian market is is a uh, is a desired destination for the Moldovan farmers, and you know in, in Europe the so-called allies of Ukraine cut off their supplies, agricultural supplies, preventing the supplies from entering their soil. They just block roads for the Ukrainian cargo operators. They have their own interests. Where shall the Moldovans sell the, the produce of theirs? At a certain point, they uh, stated they would decline to buy our gas, but actually they, they have continued buying it. Let them act as they want, as they please. Actually, we would not see a lot of value of this nation being present as a member of the CIS, but we are not turning them down. If they want to cooperate, we are eager also. If not, it's up to them. As regards Armenia, there are some um, complex developments around Karabakh. But it wasn't, it wasn't us who, who declined Karabakh, abandoned Karabakh. It was the Armenians who accepted Karabakh, Karabakh as uh, as part of Azerbaijan, and they did not, they hadn't informed us that they were going to make this decision. I'm just stating this fact. There are both advantages and drawbacks to that, but it so happened. They have very difficult and complex domestic political developments there. I do not think that it would be in Armenia's interest to withdraw from CIS, CSTO, and other structures, the Eurasian Economic Union. But at the end of the day, nations are to make their own choices as regards the absence of the Armenian Prime Minister at joint events, as uh, to our knowledge. This has to do with some of the domestic developments in Armenia. It is not about whether they want to continue working within these integration groups or not. We have uh, 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 many, many questions. Small and medium enterprises is a relevant topic. They, these people helped Russia survive through the sanctions. Uh, Vasily Babin Sofizhevsk, a video phone in. Mr. President, good afternoon. My name is Vasily. I am from Udmutia. I represent Bangli Boo brand, producing garments for adults and children such uh, stylish combos. And uh, the, the other day, we won the contest no hours from the uh, strategic agencies, in, uh, initiatives agency. And we have been able uh, to receive promotion and ramp up our revenues and sales. And other companies, Plav produces tourist clothes with the, help, with the start of a special operation, they have been able to ramp up their sales because of the military and servicemen and the mobilized ones, which is a happy coincidence, as it seems. But the question is whether we can, in the current contest, come shape the system of support for the Russian brands and entrepreneurs so that it should not be one-off chances. Well, you have mentioned. that you have succeeded to increase your sales as well as your partners also, your colleagues. Well, the National Bank and the Strategic Initiatives Agency have been pursuing support measures. And this agency for strategic initiatives has the backing of the government, and they opened a call for national brands, and definitely it has been 
authorized by the government. Domestically, the presence of our brands increased by 31%. You are quite correct in saying that it cannot be stopped and it also should be systemic without any doubt. Not only the federal authorities should be engaged, but also the regional authorities. And I'm now addressing heads of the regions. You should keep track of that so that regional brands are promoted, which will be diversify our market, the supply at the market, make it more attractive to the consumers. Our regions have something to be proud of. And some of the colleagues from Mordovia invited everybody to attend the, the booth, the exposition, the display of Mordova at BDNH Exhibition Center, and such things must be promoted. Each of the regions should have its own program to support SMEs and promote our brands. We've been watching the AI development, and many people keep a fearful eye on that. Arina Dmitrievna from the Volgograd region, a phone-in. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Arina. I'm eight years old. Uh, at a lesson, our teachers told us that the the human will be superseded by the machine. Can it supersede me, my father, mother, and my grandparents, whether we should fear robots or not? Until you reply, we have another video on the same topic. Quite impressive. Let's have a look at this video. Mr. President, good afternoon. I am a student, and I study at the St. Peter uh, Institute. Do you have a lot of twins? And another point, what is your attitude towards the dangers fraught with the neural networks and the artificial intelligence? So he did not introduce himself, this person from St. Petersburg. <laughs> oh, well, <clears throat> I see. You can talk like me and use my voice, my pitch, but I figured The only one person could speak like myself and use my voice, and this is going to be me. It was a joke by one of our political figures as regards the AI. Uh, this is my first twin. This is my twin number one. Uh, responding to Irina Dmitrievna's question, Arina, I can tell you for sure, this is certain. No one will supersede your grandma. It is impossible to replace your grandma. Well, whether we should fear the AI or not, preventing the, the advance in the artificial intelligence, including artificial general intelligence, detecting smells and having senses, and possessing the cognitive capability, being able to auto study. It's impossible to prevent that. Unless we can prevent it, we should head and lead the process. We should be among the leaders in this domain. No one knows, however, where shall we end up. This is the reality of today. So we can talk about restrictions and self-restrictions, and we should come to terms, I mean, among the leaders, to prevent us from lapsing into some dangerous situations for the humanity when the nuclear energy was weaponized as a nuclear bomb and uh, everybody became aware that the threat was 
increasing and the damage would be unsurmountable, unacceptable. They started coming to terms. So it will happen, I think, to the AI when the leaders in the sector will grasp that it's dangerous, there are some perils, they will start negotiating. But prior to that, no one will hardly uh, attain any, any, any accords. Coming back to the audience, coming back to the audience, there are some journalists, mass media representatives. There are two questions from Ria Novosti and the Republic of Serbia. First of all, first of all, Ria Novosti news agency and then Republic of Serbia. Uh, Ilana Gushakova, Ria Novosti. Well, the general uh, agenda includes items of the special military operation and the new regions, well, I mean the domestic agenda, but there are other regions that are suffering from difficulties, like let me mention the Belgorod and the Kursk regions living in a dire situation, being target of shelling. And the a colleague of mine from Voloska's Vizda newspaper says that uh, shelling and bombing has become their routines, daily routines. Do you think enough is done today in order to protect these residents and, and, and defend their homes and households? And my second question is about the, the enterprise. Like, there is a huge factory in Shebekino, and uh, whether the government helps them, and uh, whether entrepreneurship should proceed there during the, the hostilities. And we have a question uh, calling from Shebekino from an, a business lady, Jelena uh, Rasitsina, CEO of a factory in Shebekina in June. Many, event, many enterprises were, became targets of terrorist attacks from the Ukrainian armed forces and were ruined. This is why we want to ask your personal assistance and flag and Shenkes we want would like to receive federal grants in order to reconstruct our enterprises and preserve around 3,000 jobs and uh, reconstruct, reconstruct unique manufacturing facilities of the products that are now on sanction lists, but we produce them domestically, and specifically in the, in the settlement of Shebekino. And probably there should be a special, introduced a special economic zone in Shebekino for three to five years to help the manufacturing capability restore after this terrorist attack on the part of Ukraine. I'll, I'll answer briefly. I think now the context of special, a special economic area in Shebekina is a good idea and that, that should be backed. I'd ask the government to make such proposal in the near future to preserve jobs there and guarantee the restoration of, of uh, the economic activity in that area. Republic, Republika Srpska. Just a second. While the question was asked, I also read one of them in, in the big screen. It is important. There's a family with kids and they have a mortgage loan. The mortgage, the, the family mortgage is going to expire in, in, by July next year. And the government is now thinking whether to extend it or not. The government should look at the real funds and capability of the federal budget, but probably we should uh, extend the family mortgage with the down with a minimum down payment of 20 percent and the rate of six percent per annum. But if you have three kids, probably subsidies would flow in around 450,000 rubles. So this is something we should contemplate, and I will instruct the government to prepare a proposal on, on that. The Rep Republika Srpska. 
Good afternoon, President Putin. My name is Darinka Petrovich. I'm a journalist from the Republic Srpska, the alternative television. We are all and you've been talking about the serious situation all over the world, about the conflicts ranging from Ukraine to the Middle East. And naturally, this also affects the Balkan region. And this complicates the already serious and aggravated situation, especially in Bosnia Herzegovina and the Republic of Srpska. You're very well aware of the current political situation in Bosnia. It is de facto a Western protectorate. We are working under the illegitimate uh, office of the high representative, and the Serbians are accused of supporting Russia and uh, accused of having good, brotherly, friendly relations with your country. And uh, the authorities of the Republic of Srpska are being accused of the so-called expansion of the malignant Russian influence. The Republic of Srpska doesn't have any Russian media outlets. It doesn't have Russian missions. On the other hand, there is an inundation of the Western media and various organizations of the kind. I would like to ask you, what is your vision of the future of the Republic of Srpska and the entire region? How could you comment on that, keeping in mind that all the major wars always started in the Balkans? I have many other questions, but I don't want to take the time from my colleagues. We'll leave this for later, when someday we have an interview with you. Thank you. Thank you. I will try to be brief as well. We are well aware of the situation in the Republic of Srpska and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Our own evaluations of the situation fully coincide with those of your authorities. Now, speaking of the Russian media, it's a shame that they're not present there. I'm not sure if RT has a reception there. You have no RT? We should think about that, then. I will ask our colleagues to consider that and see what can be done. Speaking of the future, the future shall be defined by the people living in that territory. And no matter what decisions from the past or the present are imposed on those living in a certain territory, at the end of the day, if we are truly seeking a balanced world that considers everyone's interests, First of all, the interests of those living in a certain territory. We should take into account the sentiments, the plans, and the ambitions of these people. Our policy towards Bosnia and Herzegovina and the Republic of Srpska will be based on these exact principles. Please keep it down, tone it down a bit. Let's stay calm. Let's be civil. Yes, let's move on to the Lugansk Donetsk People's Republics. Yes, it doesn't matter to me who starts. Good afternoon, Mr. Putin. Thank you for giving us the floor. Please introduce yourself. My name is Evgeny Rolov, Lugansk 24 channel. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We come here with no questions. Today, I believe that the People's Republic of Lugansk has nothing to complain about and no one to complain about. We are here to thank you personally for taking Donbass as part of the Russian Federation. We thank the government for the work they've been doing, for the integration, which are moving very smoothly, and a special thanks for all the partnering regions. They are tirelessly working. Our children are finally moving on to the playgrounds. They have new kindergartens and schools. We bow down to you. The entire Donbass would like to shake your hand. And a small question still, if I may. When, 
Yes, thank you. Yes, I will come. You're asking when I will come, and I will definitely come visit you. And I would ask to... I would like to tell you once again, everything looks quite modest. It doesn't resemble Moscow, to be sure. Moscow is one of the leading cities of the world, at least today. Lugansk is more modest, but still everything is quite clear and neat, and that shows the overall high level of culture of the people living in your territory. It shows the nature of those who live in Donbass and the Lugansk People's Republic. You have a very strong character that's been reinforced by the many years of your struggle. You never gave up, and victory shall be ours. So, for you and for all those living in Donbass, I would like to thank you and wish you all the success. We continue to receive a great deal of questions. Yes, there is someone waiting. Hello, I'm a volunteer from the Donetsk People's Republics for nine years. We have been helping the region of Donbass ever since the beginning of the hostilities. My friends, the volunteers have died during their humanitarian missions. I was also injured. I've seen death with my own eyes. Mr. Putin, every day we're crossing and threading the line between life and death. We have volunteers from other region. They have certain insurance. And if they die or if they are injured, their relatives receive the material compensations. However, such insurances do not exist for the people of Donetsk and Lugansk republics. At home, we are taking the same risks as the people from other regions. If possible, I would ask you to give the same status to all the volunteers of Russia. I fully agree with you. I have already mentioned a topic like that. Everyone should be equal. It doesn't matter where these people live. It doesn't matter if they were Russian citizens when they were injured, in your case especially. This especially concerns the volunteers who are following their hearts, who are helping our guys, helping the civilians in these territories, those who risk their lives and health. Of course we should do that. Of course we will seek that, and I will definitely make sure everything's carried out. Yes, we thank you. We have a great number of calls and video calls. Wait a moment, if I may, we have a very important question from the villages as well. Please wait. Let us take a second. I've been reading uh, the stream on the screen. When will the microfinancial and the microloan organizations be eliminated. Should we do that? I'm not sure. There are problems, but these companies are quite useful for some people. However, they may abuse the people's trust or do something else that they shouldn't really be doing. We should keep them in line. That's true. And let me note once again, I have been talking with the relevant financial authorities we have been discussing the work of these so-called microloan and payday loan organizations. Yes, now a question from the villagers. Distinguished Mr. Putin, I am the head of the so-called uh, enterprise Dmitry Panyan, the Cossack of Don, of the Volgograd region of the Serebranska Hutor. For several years we have been working to restore the cattle farm, meat and dairy farm, and we have been doing quite well. Farms like ours with 100 to 200 units of cattle are optimal for the meat and dairy farming in the future. I have a question. Is the Agriculture Ministry planning any additional programs to support such small-scale farms? And a second question. We transport our milk and dairy products with tractors on bad roads. Perhaps someday we will see the day that we get the good quality roads. And finally, I would like to say hi to all our people, to our warriors. I wish them victory. Glory to Russia. And where was he from? This was a question from the Volgograd region. And another question. People 
from the villages are wondering if the country is ensuring food security in all the major categories. Yes, let's take the first question first. The Agricultural Ministry has numerous programs to support the agriculture sector, and we're allocating great financement for that. However, it takes active work from the villagers to achieve the results, and the results are quite good. Speaking of small-scale farms, out of all the volume of aid provided by the state to agriculture, 40 percent is allocated to the farmers. And the farmers are getting more numerous. I think about 15 percent of the farmers ensure the overall demand on the domestic market. Their produce is quite diverse, and they can further diversify our domestic market of agricultural products. And that's also good. Now I would like to address everyone working in the villages, the large-scale farmers and small-scale domestic farmers. I would like to thank you for your results this year. Once again, we're seeing a record high yields. One. 150 something million tons of grains have been produced this year. That's the overall figure in the gross product. The final figures will be about 146 something million tons after processing. This includes the so called new territories, who also produce five or six million tons of grains. The results are very good and solid. I was talking about the Ministry of Agriculture today. We were mentioning the lack of supply for chicken eggs as well as poultry. There is something to criticize them for. However, the overall results of the agricultural sector can be seen as very good and solid this year. It is thanks to the efforts of the Agricultural Ministry, too. They are worth of praise and a good evaluation. Speaking specifically of the small-scale farms, we are providing assistance to them. There is a number of programs, and if you need something, we can talk about that. I would ask the authorities and the leadership of the Ministry of Agriculture to contact your enterprise and talk about it. We have several options for the support of small farms. We should use the existing opportunities. There's no need for new ones. And for you personally, I can assure you, we will continue working. The Ministry will contact you and talk about it as well. Speaking of food security, rest assured, the Russian food security is insured. We have certain problems definitely relating to seeds, first of all seeds, I'd say, of various plants. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work ahead of us. We have the selection issues, we have national programs to the year of 2030 on seeds specifically. Or well, I think, yes, I think it's up to 2030. And it's also active. We're working on that. The necessary financement is allocated. This is a problem that we should solve. And we will seek a solution. Mr. President, next year in Russia is the year of the family. It's a great reason to remember our loved ones. You said that there's nothing better than a family with children. This year I became a mother. My daughter turned six months today. The topic of children is a very delicate one. Sometimes it happens that a woman learns of pregnancy and for certain reasons they may decide to abort their pregnancy. This is a very hot and pressing topic today and it is of concern today. Let me read a couple of addresses from Moscow. We ask you to stop this mess with the abortions. 
the ban on private clinic abortion would increase the load on the state hospitals, which are quite struggling under the new reform. This would result in a black market and increased mortality among women. This is ridiculous. What do you think of that? Is there a ban? Not. Well, now abortions and the number of abortions in private uh, clinics is reduced. Why are they speaking about this uh, dire situation in with the abortions? I have just remembered the bans. Um, the anti-alcoholic company. It uh, resulted uh, in the fact that people started consuming surrogates, uh, and uh, they were being they were getting poisoned because of that. So, in this sphere, we also need to be very careful. Of course, I know about the position of the church. And the church cannot have any other position because they are fighting for the life of every person. And ha and it has its own opinion about abortions. I have just uh, mentioned uh, the tragic results of the anti-alcohol camp campaign. But the state is interested in this because it is a demographic problem. So after women get to know and that they're pregnant, uh, it would be better for us if they decide to preserve the life inside of them. Of course, uh, there we should uh, keep in mind the rights and the liberties of every woman. Well, if we're speaking about solving this problem, First of all, there are minimum two uh, spheres. First of all, uh, we should remember about our traditional values. One of them is a large, a large family. As well, we should think about education. And we should uh, consider children as a gift from the God or the women and the man. And uh, it also is connected to the economic prosperity. We were speaking about the primary health care. We should also pay attention to uh, women consultations to maintain order there. There is a lot to be done. We should understand how and at what pace we are going to maintain order in uh, the regional uh, hospitals, uh, birth uh, wards uh, in the regional uh, hospitals. And one more thing, we also need to think about how we will keep working further to support families with children. I'm speaking about mortgages, uh, benefits, uh, subsidies, uh, and uh, all the necessary instruments uh, that uh, were developed by have by the government uh, if we're speaking about supporting families now let's uh, return to the regions uh, to the journalists uh, i see a row in the middle uh, the turn to the east please uh, introduce yourself so mr president pavel zaitsev uh, public uh, television of primoria um, well, it's not far, so far as our, my, our colleague from Magadan. Well, turn to the east. This is a global strategy. We have spoken about it, uh, discussed it uh, previously. And now gradually the program is being implemented, especially economically. We have touched upon many spheres. Uh, for instance, uh, railway, uh, car transport, uh, planes. That is what uh, Far East is concerned about. But uh, we are speaking about uh, gas supply to friendly countries of Asia. You also spoke about gas supply. It is uh, very important, especially for the Far East. So um, is the Asian market uh, a good perspective for us? 
what are the prospects, what will it result in. And I would also like to ask something else. Uh, many Russians have these questions. Uh, we encountered on many websites and internet platforms. There is a sanction pressure, enormous sanction pressure and on Russia, and there is a, a difficult uh, geopolitical situation. Why gas is still supplied to uh, the West, for instance, uh, to Moldova that you mentioned, especially through Ukraine. Maybe we should turn to Asia, to our friends, and maybe we should uh, pay attention to gas supply to the regions. We are working uh, on gas supply. I have already spoken about, about it. Uh, 450,000 households um, have already been connected uh, to uh, gas. A million uh, received a technical opportunity to do that, and we are going to continue this work. Why are we supplying gas to Europe? Gazprom is uh, a reliable partner, and it has contractual obligations, uh, we, which uh, it was always uh, complying with, and that is what it is doing now. Well, uh, they have the problems uh, saying that that saying that they are, we were to blame uh, that we were not uh, um, selling gas we did not uh, close Yamal Europa pipeline uh, we didn't close the another pipeline that goes through Ukraine it was uh, the action of Ukraine we did not uh, undermine North Stream uh, pipeline Maybe it was done by the U.S. or maybe it was done, it was organized by them. Partially, uh, one pipeline is uh, uh, functioning. Um, I'm speaking about Nord Stream. Uh, it could be open, but Germany does not do anything about this. If they doesn't want it, to, well, it's their decision. They have problems in the industry, chemical and uh, other uh, industries uh, and everything that is related to them. Well, it means uh, that um, there'll be a recession in uh, maybe a small one in uh, the German economy, but Gazprom is fulfilling all its, all its obligations, especially using the pipelines uh, through Ukraine. Of course, uh, Ukraine receives money for tran transit. We do not provide anything to Ukraine. They uh, use our gas. You know how uh, gas supply works in Ukraine since uh, the Soviet times. There is a main pipeline that goes to Europe. Uh, but when gas enters Ukrainian territory, it goes all around the, the territory. The Ukraine has accumulated uh, gas uh, through uh, the summer on the western border. And uh, it is made as if uh, gas goes uh, directly through gas. And this is how uh, we, uh, the, the obligations are fulfilled. First of all, we're speaking about southern Europe. Why should we punish uh, Slovakia or other countries? They pay us always, and they pay us a lot. That is why we never did anything uh, because of the politics, and we're not going to do that. As for the East, well, we turn to the East not because uh, we have uh, worse relations uh, uh, with Ukraine, uh, we started it even before. For instance, the power of Siberia, we started constructing it even before because uh, this is the trend of development of, of the world economy. There are new centers of economic growth. Uh, there are consumers, the main consumers. That is where we are going. Uh, we are sending there our coal, gas, and uh, oil. So thank you for all these economies uh, that they consume our energy and pay us for it. And we're uh, going to widen our supplies to China and other countries that could be our possible consumers. Well, if they buy our energy, that's okay. Uh, we are not against it. As for the Arctic, for instance, there is a company, Navatech, 
that is also working with some European uh, partners and Asian partners, for instance, with China. They're actively cooperating and they're going to continue that activity. So in this regard, the situation is stable. It is not based on a political situation, but uh, on fundamental interest of Russia of orienting to the uh, emerging economic centers. We also need to mention one more topic uh, that concerns uh, people, labor migration. Uh, in big cities, uh, there, were, there was uh, snows, and we're thanking migrants for helping us to cope with that. Uh, well, uh, but let's say it mildly. There are concerns of the number of migrants, uh, the consequences of such migration, and some regions are introducing restrictions on the number of uh, migrants. What do you think? It's a difficult problem, and it is characteristic for many countries, for us as well. There are more than 10 million of migrants. But uh, let's take labor market. Uh, Two and nine percent is uh, the level of inflation, we, uh, unemployment, and so it's very low. But it doesn't mean that we should do everything and in detriment to the people of Russia uh, to solve the economic problems, uh, solve the labor market problems. Of course, we need to uh, work with the migrants. But first of all, we're speaking about qualified uh, labor. Of course, uh, we need uh, less qualified workers. We cannot do without them. But we need to cooperate with uh, our partners, with the countries uh, where people are migrating from. Our friends from these countries uh, are in favor of that. They open Russian schools with Russian language classes. They, we open. Um, our uh, offices of our universities and institutes, they need us to send, uh, and they ask us to send our teachers, uh, to send our uh, school books. Moreover, all migrants, without any doubt, should respect our laws and traditions of the peoples of the Russian Federation. The authorities should uh, monitor this and they should react operative or rapidly to the violations. We should create good conditions uh, for migrants. Uh, I have seen uh, on these boards, on the screens, uh, I, there was a question, how much are we going to spend on solving the social uh, problems, social issues of the families of migrants. Yes, this is a sensitive, a sensitive question. We cannot just uh, leave these uh, people, these women, uh, children. We should influence them. It's not simple. It's not black or white. In some schools, uh, there are more uh, uh, children of migrants than of local people. So we need to work to, with them. We need to prepare them. We should not uh, uh, say that uh, the problem appears just now. We need a special organ for that, not only the Ministry of the Interior. We need a special organism that would uh, anal analyze this problem comprehensively and uh, would find solutions to every aspect of this issue. A lot has to be done, but without any doubt, we need to, first of all, be guided, and I would like to point that out for everyone, for all the levels of the authority, we sh first of all should be guided by the interests of uh, the local citizens of uh, the Russian Federation. There were many messages and many requests to you from uh, the citizens of many European countries, citizens uh, from the U.S., to give them Russian citizenship. Italy, Switzerland, different countries, Germany. And the histories that uh, people describe are just drastic. For instance, in Sweden, a family uh, was uh, 
had to leave their house. Uh, they were evicted from their house, and they want to live in Russia now. There are rules, certain rules. Uh, there are laws about obtaining Russian citizenship. We welcome all the law-abiding citizens of other countries that want to move to Russia and want to tie their destiny and the destiny of their children with Russia. Maybe there, there is no mass influx compared to the number of migrants going to the Western Europe from Africa, Middle East, or to the U.S. from Latin America. That influx will soon change the ethnic composition in the United States. And the uh, share of Latin American population will increase. We need to closely follow that. However, what, what you've mentioned, uh, the category of people that you've mentioned, people who are uh, fully consciously not to, not due to economic reasons, but to, uh, for other reasons, want to move, we're well prepared to accept them. Well, we have crossed the line of four hours. Shall we do a, a, a speed tour? Who did you wish to become when you were a child? Well, I've, I've spoken about that before. I think that every person throughout his life, in different times of his life, has different values. Uh, I wanted to be a pilot, but my main one when I was in high school I wanted to be an intelligence officer, officer, and I became that. A New Year question: What what do you like more, um, herring in fur coat or uh, Olivia? It depends what uh, what you're drinking. What's the most memorable gift from um, Father Frost? The most memorable gift, and I think that many people in the audience and those who are listening to us. they will agree that the greatest present for them would be children and the children of our children. That's a gift from God. What kind of advice would you give to youth? Incidentally, uh, going back to gifts and presents, I think that what's the most heartwarming is not the gifts that we give, however, but the gifts that we give. Because we're looking in the mirror and thinking, what a great person I am. And I think that's true, especially for the men in the audience and around the country. It gives us more pleasure to give presents rather than to receive presents from someone, though both are very pleasant. What kind of advice would you give to the youth? We have a lot of um, folk sayings, and one of them Preserve your honor from youth in the widest sense of the world. Today, you need to think about tomorrow. What, what I would add to that is that you need to always set ambitious goals for yourself. To set such goals and such tasks that sometimes would seem unattainable, however, if you set such goals for yourself, such a person would always strive to achieve that and will necessarily achieve success. What are you reading right now? Well, uh, I will reread the penal code, I think, because some, some think that uh, our punishment is too harsh for a certain minor delinquency, as, as uh, um, our colleagues think. Well, I don't have a lot of time for reading. At my bedside table, so to speak, I have a, a, a volume of poems by a poet Lermontov. He was a genius young man. And it's very interesting the way the genius people of those times, the way they thought, what kind of values they had. Um, how does it transpose on, on today? He was indeed a genius. It gives me great pleasure to read that. Mr. Peskov, 
Indeed, we have been working for more than four hours. Maybe we can wrap it up uh, talking to the media, to the journalists here. Well, let's give the floor to Buratia. And Burats uh, do not go back, do not recede. As you said, they, they don't run away. Uh, that's not what, what I said, but our hero, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Yekaterina Yelistratova, Ulanude, Republic of Buratia. As you know, we have a unique center of Eastern medicine. That's the only center in our country where they treat using traditional and um, non-traditional Eastern um, medicine. Right now, they're helping in rehabilitation of those who served during the special military operation. There is great demand, and we want to expand. We wanted the, the fighter to the servicemen to receive as a lot of rehabilitation because indeed people are bouncing back. We have good examples. I would like to ask to help create a new facility building and to give us the status of a um, scientific and research institution. Thank you. I, I just need to have some more specifics. Where specifically it's situated? I'll, okay, we have just one such center. Yes, we'll, 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 we'll take uh, the contacts. And, okay. Excuse me. Let's, uh, let's move over here. Over, over here. Yugra, please. Mr. President, hello. As the outcome of the August conversation with the members of the government, you gave the task to review the possibility of creating a railroad connecting uh, Siberia, Ugra with China. How realistic this project is and when can we expect its implementation? Yes, it's a necessary project and the government as well as Russian railroads are looking at different options. It always has to do with the investment program of the Russian railroads. Of course, now the most meaningful development is the Eastern Polygon. All of our effort is focused there. However, this direction also has to do with that main line, with solving the main line tasks. I won't lie to you. I'll ask Mr. Belozorov and Mr. Belousov who's uh, responsible for that in the government. And we'll get back to that question and, and look at it. Thank you. Siberia. Let, let's go to Siberia. Good afternoon. Yelena Belaeva, Irtish, Omsk News. We already spoke today about the, the turn to the east. Right now, there is, we have specific economic interest in that. And now, Omsk region is at the crossroads of major transportation routes. As you know, we have the Trans-Siberian mainline, we have Irtish as the navigable river and a federal uh, mainline connecting the east and the west of the country. And the main transportation is done to Kazakhstan through the Omsk region as well. However, we have an issue, a rather lengthy part, lag of the road um, in great demand. Uh, two men, Novosibirsk, is just two lanes, a lot of accidents happening there. I travel it myself. I see a lot of um, trucks lying on the ground on the uh, roadsides. Do you plan to, to expand this um, highway and um, in order to solve those logistic challenges that the country needs? We also need a major modern airport international grade airport. Can we expect uh, to have federal support? Well, look, at the beginning of our conversation, we were talking about highway, Moscow, Kazan, and later to two men and Novosibirsk. We want to create a, a ring there. We have um, money allocated for that. And this pro these projects have been implemented. As for specifically this lag, I need to take a look at that. I'll ask Mr. Kusnulin, but it requires major investment. You know, we have to implement what we have already scheduled, what um, 
the construction and outlines have, have been uh, drafted and so on. But I'll, I'll talk to the Transportation Ministry and the responsible uh, Deputy Prime Minister, naturally. We'll think about it. Please don't shout. The final question. We have been working for more than four hours now. Andrei Kolesnikov will uh, wrap up this part of the press conference. Commerçant newspaper. Mr. President, you spoke yourself that the world will never be the same again. If you had such such a if you had an opportunity, what would you tell Vladimir Putin of 2000, of the year 2000? What kind of advice would you give to him? Would you warn him about something? Do you regret anything? What, what, what kind of advice? I'll say that you're going the right path, comrades. What I would warn him against from being naive and being overly trusting towards the so-called partners. As for advice and recommendations, you need to believe in the great Russian in the great people of Russia. And this faith is the, is key to rebirth and st strengthening of Russia. Thank you. Please don't be cross with me if I didn't answer all of your questions. But indeed, it's high time to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Goodbye.